<laughs> oh no. <laughs> Drama. Be so self-conscious about how to talk to Bring in the drama. Drama, drama, drama. We're here. We're here. We're ready for a show. Waiting for my cue. I think we're ready to go. Oh, that's the cue. We're live. Are you ready for this week in start science? What am I? What show am I doing this week in this science? Startants. <laughs> the startants. <laughs> Starting the show in three, two, this is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 745, recorded on Wednesday, October 30th, 2019. Who needs a microbiome anyway? Hey there, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on This Week in Science, we will fill your head with brains. Monkeys and bacteria, but first. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. There are creatures living in the darkness. Despite any evidence to the contrary, you are most likely a human. Uh, what it means to be human is a question with many possible answers. Could be our thoughts, desires, and feelings. Could be our intellect, ethics, and accomplishments. Our anatomy can be considered distinctly human, and our DNA as well. But there is something else, something distinctly not human, living in the darkness inside every one of us. The bacteria in our guts. And these living creatures have much more to do with all of the things we think of as strictly human than we realized until recent years. But far from being body snatchers, they help us be humans. In fact, Bacteria are so essential to a healthy human life that without them, we couldn't have This Week in Science coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know. to you kiki and blair and a good science to you too justin blair and everyone out there welcome to another episode of this week in science we are back again on our spooky twist ween show yes. well yeah Ooh. well it's not quite halloween that's tomorrow night as we are sitting here on the 30th of october 2019 recording the show there are some and, time zones where it's Halloween already. We can oh, just, th that's yeah. true. All right. Thank you for that reminder. We are on a <laughs> oblate spheroid body that is rotating in space. Yep. Yeah. There we go. Um, and what did I want to talk about? Oh, yeah. We have all sorts of science stories for you tonight. We bring the science and we have got a lot of it. I have brains because... Who doesn't want brains? And I also have a scary story of artificial intelligence taking over something. <laughs> kind of. Kind of. And we also have an interview coming up about microbiomes and <gasps> not having one. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Justin, what did you bring? I have got antibacterial microbiota. And uh, better, faster, stronger robots. Better, faster, stronger. There we go. And Blair, the animal corner, please. Oh, my goodness. It's a very spooky animal Ooh. corner. I have rat-eating monkeys. Yeah. I have a six-fingered harbinger of death. I have rats <laughs> with road rage and spider copulatory organs. Hmm. That's you know, double, one. double, toil and trouble, fire, <laughs> burn, and cauldron, yeah. bubble, spider, copulatory organs, and newt, eye of newt. You know, it's yeah. one of those things. Yeah, yeah, just like and that. I, and <laughs> I can't wait to find out if it's if it's rats that are eating monkeys or monkeys that are eating the rats. Because mm. the way you said, it, it could be either way. Mm -hmm. mm. You'll have to wait. 
Yeah, let your imagination run until then. As we jump in the show, I want to remind you that if you have not yet subscribed to Twists, you can do so by looking for us all places podcasts are found. Look for This Week in Science. You can also search for us on YouTube, on Facebook, or you can visit our website, twistwis.org, twist.org. Twist.org is also where you can find a link to purchase our 2020 Twist Blair's Anim- Animal Corner calendar. They are available for pre-order now. We're going to be ordering them and sending them to you soon, but we need you to order. So if you need a calendar for 2020, get on it. Go to our website. And the final little tiny bit of business we are on YouTube right now, and there's this thing going on. Hashtag Team Trees. Has anyone heard of Team Trees? Mm-mm. No, you haven't heard of Team Trees? No. There is a uh, YouTuber named Mr. Beast YT who started a big effort to plant 20 million trees before the end of the year. And so, right now, if you look for Team Trees, go to uh, look for hashtag Team Trees. You can find links uh, to go and donate to the Arbor Foundation. Every dollar plants a tree. And right now we have lots of people who we are over 10 million trees already. And it's only wow. been going for about a week. It's very, very exciting. Cool. Yeah. So let's be part of trying to plant trees. I mean, it's not going to fix climate change, but it is a big step in moving in the right direction and showing us all if we work together, we can do some really amazing things. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Hashtag team trees. Ah! So let's move in to the rest of the show. Are you ready for our interview? Yes. Yes. I would love to introduce our guest tonight. Dr. Tobin Hammer is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Texas at Austin and describes himself as a combination ecologist, evolutionary biologist, entomologist, microbiologist, and naturalist. Just pick one. Lots of hats. (laughs) Very many hats. Um, His work centers on the study of the interactions between insects, currently bees, butterflies, moths, and their microbes. Thank you for joining us on the show tonight, Tobin. Thanks for having me. It's great to, great to be here, chat about microbiomes and bugs. Yes. All right. So you've, you've said it out loud. In the disclaimer, Justin was disclaiming about the human microbiome. And we have, when we talk about the microbiome and what we're discovering as its absolute importance in, in human functioning. I mean, this, this mm. week alone, there's a study that said that if you go outside and get UV and vitamin D, that it will benefit your microbiome in your gut. If you get sleep, it benefits the microbiome in your gut. There's all this news. Why did you go for microbiome of bugs? Um, I've been, honestly, I'm much more interested in insects than humans. No, <laughs> no, no offense to humans, but insects are just so much more fascinating. There's such a huge diversity of lifestyles and behaviors and appearances. And so I've just been really interested in insects for a long time. And of course, they're also really important to humans. So there's a lot of interest in controlling disease and, and uh, agricultural pests and, and supporting pollinators and so forth. So there is, you know, understandably, a lot of research into understanding how insects work. And so I came at insects from more of a microbiology background. And so that was kind of a natural uh, question to start looking at how insects interact with microbes. And of course, people have been doing that for many years for certain groups of insects, but um, some groups have been much better studied than others. Um, and I kind of launched into the butterflies and moths, which um, have been really well studied for other aspects of their biology, but hadn't been that much work on their microbiomes. And now I kind of have a better sense of why that is, but I wasn't really aware of that from the, from the onset. Butterflies, moths, they go through metamorphosis. This is something that I have wondered forever. What if they have a microbiome as caterpillars? Mm -hmm. What happens to that microbiome? Yeah. When they're in a soup in the cocoon. What happens? (laughs) Yeah. So that's a great question. And that was actually my first um, project in grad school was looking at how 
uh, the microbiomes shift from the larval stage to the chrysalis when it's undergoing metamorphosis when, to when the adult emerges. Because, you know, as you mentioned, you know, their butterflies are famous for doing this and they completely change. And, you know, the, in a nutshell, we found that their, the composition of their microbes changes too. Um, and maybe it's not super surprising, you know, as a caterpillar, they're eating leaves. As an adult butterfly, they're, you know, um, visiting flowers and drinking nectar. And the structure of their gut completely changes. They make a whole new gut. And so from like a microbes perspective, it's like a completely different species of animal, even though it is the same individual as a larva and an adult. So that was kind of a, a clue that there was something really different going on between the caterpillars and the adults, at least in terms of what types of microbes are in there. Um, and um, there, there are a lot of other examples of that from beetles and flies and other insects that undergo metamorphosis. So how does that, how does that transition take place? Because uh, I, I was thinking of uh, part of what a microbiota does is it allows you to better digest the food that you're you're taking. Mm -hmm. up. So so if you're switching foods along the way here mm -hmm. too, do you have to go and get this? Is it on the plant that they're getting it, or is it where does this come from? Yeah, so that's a really major question in in microbiome research. Where where do the microbes come from? What do they do? How does that potentially change across development of the animal, like from a larval stage to an adult stage. In the case of caterpillars, um, what I found was that they actually don't have a role in digestion, which is oh, wow. surprising coming at it from a human perspective yeah. or cows or lots of other animals where that's like a critical function that we think of. And that is certainly true, but it doesn't necessarily apply to all animals. Um, but even within a butterfly, say, a caterpillar may not need microbes for digestion, but the adult might, because it's eating very different things. These particular butterflies that I worked on also feed on pollen, um, which is, you know, a kind of a tough food to, to break down. And so that's one of the things I'm working on now is whether the butterflies use microbes to help digest pollen. Um, but as far as where they're coming from, in the caterpillars, what's in the gut generally seems to be what they're eating. And that's actually very different from, from humans again. I like yeah. I, I use humans as kind of a reference point because that's what we're, what's really best studied now. There's been so much work on human microbiomes. And in humans, we have really specific microbes that are kind of native to the human gut habitat. And they do kind of move around between people and they're temporarily can be in the environment and stuff, but they're not generally coming in from food. And so it's a very different scenario as with like a caterpillar. That's really interesting. Yeah. So, so I guess there is a uh, then a diversity of whether it's function or, uh, for digestion or if it's doing something else or if it's just found a niche there. Uh -huh. There was uh, there was a a group of microbes that were found to be in uh, in bamboo eaters. Uh, a bamboo eating lemur, a panda, the red panda, which isn't related to the giant panda. Uh, <laughs> And it was also happened to be one of these microbes was commonly found or previously been found only in termites, mm -hmm. uh, which would which would make you think this was a very specific digestion thing. But it could be something that's already on plants from what you're saying. And they, they, they're just all happen to be uh, begetting. Yeah, and totally. And that and, and that's so it's really easy within this like microbiome science to identify a particular species of bacterium and say, hey, that's related to this other bacterium that's been found in this other animal. And in that other animal, it does X, Y, and Z. Well, since it's you know closely related, it probably does X, mm -hmm. Y, and Z in this animal too. But that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. And in the example you mentioned, it may have this, you know, the bacteria are maybe on bamboo generally, and they're just kind of passing through all of these bamboo eaters. And that's very different from contributing to digestion of bamboo. And there does, it's really, pandas are really interesting because they're this weird herbivorous bear. Yes. And yeah. they have a, a bear-like, carnivore-like gut. Very different from a typical ruminant gut, for example. Um, and they have a lot of traits in common with caterpillars, actually. They're kind of, I, I like to think of them as like big furry caterpillars. Um, <laughs> and I, I think that there, there's, there's some kind of tentative evidence that that extends to their microbiome, how their microbiomes work too. 
Um, oh my god, pandas, just big furry caterpillars. <laughs> well, there are caterpillars <laughs> called woolly bears. It's true. So it's, it's not true. that far of a jump, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, so like a really kind of noteworthy thing about caterpillar guts is that they have really short and really broad guts and the food passes through really fast. Mm -hmm. And that's all of those traits are also the case for pandas. Um, and so if the food is passing through, they're kind of getting a little bit of nutrients out of it, but they're not really efficiently breaking down all of the fiber that's in there. Okay, so yeah, this is a picture of a caterpillar that I dissected. Um, and I'll just walk through it really quickly. So this is like showing the back of the caterpillar kind of opened up lengthwise. And that big sausage thing in the middle, that's the mid gut, that big green tube. Mm -hmm. And then there's like a little bit of hind gut, which is the colon of the caterpillar. Oops. And, um, and so food just kind of passes through in a few hours and they're, essentially like just these big simple tubes that are just kind of like funneling leaves, mulched leaves through, and then they just defecate it out. Um, and yeah, if we could look at one of those frass pictures, that would be great too. Frass, one of so, my favorite words yeah. in biology. So frass is, is entomology jargon for poop. Um, and so this is a photo of that was taken from a collaborator of mine who runs this caterpillar environmental outreach organization called the Caterpillar Lab. He's also a professional photographer and he <laughs> made the series of caterpillar frass photos. And this is kind of like, and here's another uh, frass photo that I took from a, a tomato hornworm. And it's really interesting that you break open these fecal pellets and you see like just mulched leaf material. You can sometimes see individual bites of the leaf fragments that the caterpillar like swallowed and then just crapped out the other end. So like here you can see that really well. Um, so they're so not, they're not uh, digesting them very well. Yeah, not completely. It, exactly. Yeah. And so, yeah, there's still tons of energy and nutrients in this material and you could think of it like they're, they're wasting that, but it's from their perspective, a more efficient strategy to get a little, like a little bit of the easy nutrients out mm -hmm. quickly and then not bother with all the hard stuff and then just take another bite of food. It's kind of like they're at, if you think of yourself as like a small caterpillar on a big plant, you're at an, like an all you can eat buffet, mm -hmm. salad buffet. So you're not limited by food availability. Hmm. You're just like trying to get as much through your system to grow and get to the adult stage as fast as you can. So it's just kind of part of their lifestyle. And since they do have that just the availability of food, they haven't necessarily had to evolve the symbioses that have evolved for like cows or other ruminants that yeah. they really, maybe they don't have all the grass that they need or they, they have like cows and, uh, and deer, they have these large body sizes that they have to give so much energy to. Mm -hmm. So it's a different, a different equation. And, mm -hmm. and it's temporary. It's why mm -hmm. you don't do a ton of dental work or put braces on kids' baby teeth. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> They're going away. It's going to go away. Let's not invest too much in this. So does it become uh, then later more of an investment and more mm. uh, worth having uh, that, that more complex? Uh, in, the, in the adult butterfly yeah. moth? Yeah. So that's like a totally open question. There's like maybe three or four people who are studying – Butterf uh, adult butterfly or moth microbiomes. It's kind of a niche subject at the moment. Um, a lot of them, a lot of species don't even, a lot of species of moths don't even feed. They don't even have guts or mouth parts. It's what? just, yeah, they, they basically, they get all the energy and nutrients they need as a caterpillar. They store that up and then they live for, you know, a, a week day. or two. Yeah, <laughs> really short period of time. They mate, they fly around, they lay eggs, and then they're done. And so they don't really, really need, yeah. <laughs> they don't need to like, eat more food. That sounds awful. I feel like they just get hungrier. It's like, why, what is this feeling? I've got this really <laughs> terrible feeling in my, I don't even have a thing to have it they in. Don't, they don't even, <laughs> it would be very frustrating not to even have a mouth to eat if you're very hungry. <laughs> but it's hard to, yeah, who knows what they're thinking. Well, but but yes. would they be hungry if they don't have a proper gut? That 
Oh, or is it just getting good. more and more tired and then you're dead? Yeah, I think just tired. Just... Yeah, because they just run out of steam. You know, they yeah. run out of energy that they they accumulated as a caterpillar. Uh, but once they lay all their eggs, then like, oh, well, nothing else left to do. Their um, job is done. As a female, anyway. Yeah. yeah. So for those, you know, there may really not be any microbial contribution to their biology in any part of their life cycle. Of course, you know, as to that's just I'm just speculating, mm-hmm. and that's kind of a, a like an aspect of all of this is um, you know it's hard to disprove the existence of some important microbe that might be at some part of their life stage doing some important critical thing that's kind of hard to see. So I try to be a little bit tentative, but I would put money on that um, personally. Yeah, how is that? How- how have the ideas about all of this started to change or changed over, you know, the decades of, okay, once upon a time, you could only see the bacteria that you could culture Mm -hmm. in a dish to be able to identify them. Now we've got genetic sequencing. And so we can go, Hey, we can identify these various species. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, how does it change our perspective on what is potentially there? Oh yeah. It's totally for for better and a little bit for worse, I think it mm-hmm. totally changed. So, back in the day when we were just looking at symb- symbionts, meaning microbes associated with a host like a plant or animal tissue, you people really studied and noticed the like majorly interesting associations where you see obvious bacteria in a particular region of the gut or inside of animal cells that are really abundant. Um, especially when hosts grow new organs to host uh, symbionts, which sometimes happens. That's a really obvious anatomical feature that you'll notice if you just like pull the gut out of some beetle or whatever. Um, Oh, look, there's an appendix or... (laughs) Right, exactly. Yeah. So, so there, there had been a lot of work done on these really kind of intricate symbioses where the hosts are super investing in creating a new niche for these microbes and in return, the microbes provide important services. And so, you know, that's that's like common, especially among insects, but it's not universal. But once we kind of had DNA sequencing tools readily available, you can sequence microbes anywhere, like any surface, any drop of liquid or hair or whatever you want, you can you can sequence it. And on the the plus side is that really opens up the like animal world and plant world that we can explore. But the downside is it, it's hard to know what that means if you detect 20 species of bacteria from a swab of, you know, some animal part. Are those bacteria living? Are they associated with the tissue? Are they specific? Um, those are questions that are much easier to get at if you're actually seeing the interaction with your mm-hmm. own eyes on a microscope. Um, and then there's lots of like technical things like a lot of these sequencing studies, it's easy to get contamination. Um, so one little anecdote there is that there um, had been a lot of interest in studying potentially vertically transmitted bacteria in humans, meaning directly from the mom to, to the, the baby. Child. Yeah, yeah. Um, in utero. Mm-hmm. Um, and so uh, some folks had been sequencing placentas and finding that, hey, there's all these bacteria in there that no one has reported, even though lots of people have been studying the placenta for a long time. So maybe there's this diversity of bacteria that are actually transmitted in utero to the developing fetus and then go on to seed the gut. But it turns out that all those bacteria were contaminants they of were the all. lab protocol. Because <laughs> so we did, I, I remember when that study came out and I brought it up on the show, but I hadn't yeah. seen the uh, the retraction or the, yeah. the update that it was all contamination. But that was, oh, I remember, gosh. one big question. Yeah, totally. And <sighs> I and I I suspect that that has played out in kind of smaller ways um, beyond like the human placenta in various animals and stuff. Um, so there may be lots of cases where you can sequence, get a bunch of sequences of bacteria, but there may not have been anything there. And you would only have known that if you use other methods or if you actually just look mm-hmm. at the, the tissue or the, the gut or whatever. Right. But so, so we've 
as as an as a scientific community, we've been just of this opinion that everything has a microbiome then, and now mm-hmm. we're maybe starting to look a little bit at a little different perspective. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, I am. I'm not sure you how. Are. <laughs> well, it yeah, also... I, I was going to say, when I was looking through your, your papers and various commentary, there was a Scientific American article by Erin Ross from a while back. And within her reporting, she said that there were, there have been a few researchers finding basically this null result for micro microbiomes and having a hard time even getting their research published. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, yeah. And I was like, I was kind of surprised that I was able to get the Caterpillar paper published. Cause I was, I had heard a lot of anecdotes from people who had, Oh, I, you know, sequence all these fish or I sequence all these stick insects and we've got a bunch of kind of crap data. It doesn't look like there's anything there, but you know, we tried publishing it and the, like reviewers didn't go for it. Um, and so there's a lot of kind of uh, file drawer data sets like that, that, um, you know, and then people keep repeating the same animals over and over again, and no one knows. And then, um, but yeah, that brings up the kind of the point about, you know, it's essentially a negative result. And you can't really, philosophically speaking, you can't, pr- you can't prove that there's no microbiome or that there's no you know, beneficial effect of microbes for an animal. Right. Um, you can't, you know, prove it beyond the shadow of a doubt. And right. so, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. But I've always wanted to have a null result journal. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That, that yeah. people could just look up and see a study was done. Yeah. And didn't find anything. Right. Actually, three. Like, like you were saying. Yeah. Three studies were done. None of them found anything. And then you know people can stop looking. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I, I think there is a journal of negative results. Oh, I heard about it. And I'm not sure if that's real or if that's just like a, some wishful thinking, but that would be <laughs> that would be really useful because yeah, I've I've definitely heard of a lot of anecdotes of similar things, and I was you know that's one hope. Sorry, my cat is jumping around. Um, <laughs> one hope is that the more examples of this there are, the easier mm-hmm. it'll be for other people to publish it because it's. Like, oh, this is just like caterpillars or, oh, this is just like in these stick insects or whatever. It's not like a totally out of this world possibility that an animal might not have um, or need a microbiome. And so maybe more examples will come out of the woodwork down the road. Um, and, yeah, and, so there's, and humans, which I think of as a, I, I like, it's self-centered, uh, but I like to think of humans as being very complicated creatures with big brains. Mm-hmm. And yet we're finding that the human microbiome can affect human thinking, human behavior to, to some degree. Uh, and, and, and I've heard that this takes place also in the insect world. But if there's insects without a microbiome or without a, a, a steady one, uh, mm-hmm. how can that be? Or can, can there be enough, uh, enough of differentiation that it can, be, it can just be both? Um. Well, so, you know, I, it's certainly not like that their behavior relies on having microbes around. Like certain behaviors can be modified by microbes. There's some examples of like parasites manipulating insect behavior into doing their bidding. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are, you know, other kind of subtle examples in insects. But, you know, I, I, I don't think they're like core behavioral programs that mm-hmm. need microbes to operate. Um, but I'm not sure if I totally got all of your question. Well, there was uh, somebody we had talked to uh, years ago who had done some uh, microbiome swapping on insects and got them to go after different uh, pest insects, oh. and got them to go after different food sources mm. as a result. They would mm-hmm. switch their food source based on that change in microbiome. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so there can be some interesting effects on like the odors produced by an insect depending on the diet and how the diet affects the microbiome and then the odors of course are going to be perceived by insects in a lot of ways relevant to mating and attraction of parasites and all sorts of other things so there can be kind of these complex diet microbiome behavior feedbacks like that that are going on and those are probably much more uh widespread than we realize you know, a lot of microbes also use insects to get around. 
So like a lot of the yeasts will get from uh, like that are say uh, fermenting rotting fruit. Mm -hmm. They'll get from patch of fruit to patch of fruit or other like rotting substrates by hitchhiking with insects. So if they can attract a, a bug to eat them or pick them up and then carry them to a new spot, they can have first dibs on colonizing that patch. All higher life forms are just public transit. This yeah. is what I always say. We are a city bus for microbiome. Right. Um, yeah. Right. I there there's with the idea that our bodies or you know animal bodies are are built to resist infection, to fight off parasites, to fight off these things. Um, how does that play into this idea of maybe a you know a I guess a I guess a, a nice bell curve of distribution for no microbiome to microbiome. At what point does it, you know, does it transition from being, I'm just going to keep everything out to, right. Hey, you're my friend now. Yeah. Oh, that's a, like a really interesting kind of topic and something that I want to work on in the future. You know, the first step will be like actually getting that bell curve, knowing where different animals fall in that distribution and then we can say, what is it about animals, a certain animals that leads them to be on what end of the distribution? Um, but I think you're saying about like uh, immune defense. Mm -hmm. And so that is like one risk of having a microbiome is that you still need to defend yourself from really virulent uh, bacteria and other microbes that can cause disease but you have to support these beneficial microbes. So it's this kind of delicate balance where you have to keep your good bacteria healthy, but also ward off disease. And the good bacteria can help in warding off the disease, but it's all, like, there's a lot of complex kind of interplay there. And at least from the caterpillar point of view, um, I think that they've, yeah, they've gotten this strategy where instead of relying on beneficial microbes to help combat disease. They just go with the strategy of not letting any microbes uh, grow at all. And yeah. so there are some advantages to that um, in that you don't have to, sometimes the, even the beneficial bacteria can turn pathogenic under certain contexts. Um, and also if you just create this, this niche, either in terms of nutrients or like, I mentioned sometimes there's organs, like mm -hmm. uh, like kind of an appendix thing or pouches or what have you that can help to um, host these beneficial microbes. Well, those can more easily be invaded by foodborne pathogens, say. And um, from for caterpillars, they eat so much food. I was saying how you know they're like that's their strategy is to eat as much as they can. That's really exposing them to a lot of potential foodborne pathogens. Right. So like that salad bar analogy. <laughs> You know, you're much more likely to get E. coli infection if you eat the entire salad bar. Um, and that's kind of what caterpillars are doing. So I, it may be something about the like foodborne pathogen pressure and the cost and benefits of uh, having, you know, having or not having gut microbes. Yeah. So that's one one aspect, I think. Yeah. What is what have you been looking at? I know. So you so we've talked a little bit about the caterpillars that are, they don't have, they don't seem to have a microbiome. You've got the adult butterflies that are pollen, potentially po eating pollen and having a few microbes seems to help with that, but not having a massive microbiome versus, and then that's versus other, other butterflies that maybe exist off of nectar. And so they're like, it's just sugar. Who needs, who needs the bugs? And then You've also got um, the bees that you're working with. Um, how how are you seeing like these differences in the, the basically the gut ecology play out for these different animals? Yeah, so they're all totally different, and you know, of course, the caterpillars and butterflies being the same species or individual, but from a microbes point of view, different animals essentially. Um, yeah. Bees being completely different insects. But compared to those butterflies, they're feeding on essentially the same food of nectar and pollen. Um, but yeah, there are, you know, really the, the gut microbiome of bees, uh, for honeybees and bumblebees at least, is totally, it's a totally different ball game. So they have really, um, it's actually kind of analogous to the human gut microbiome. They have a really high density 
of very specific bacteria that are involved in digestion and also protect from disease. Um, they're located in basically the same spot. They're transmitted socially as they are in humans. There's a lot of interesting parallels there, just as an aside. Um, mm. But it's interesting that they, you know, they feed on pollen um, and nectar, um, as do almost all bees. But it's really the social bees, like bumblebees and honeybees, that have these really tight associations with these highly specific bacteria. Mm. And the thinking is that the the sociality within these colonies allows them to uh, evolve really specific bacteria because they can be transmitted from one generation to the next and stick around within an animal lineage. Um, so it's not just the diet or the life stage, but also whether a given animal is social, how social is it? Um, that's another kind of factor um, affecting what kind of microbiome an animal will have. When you're looking at these various microbiome, I, I mean, just I'm just thinking about bees, um, and I know there are, and I guess I'm thinking specifically of like honey bees, where they're making uh, people. People think you know honey is antimicrobial to a certain extent. How does how does that play into the whole uh, microbiome? Do you know if that how, how that works? So yeah, so they're not getting. So they have these very specific bacterial symbionts, they're mm -hmm. not getting them from nectar or honey. Um, and honey is actually a really difficult place to grow as a microbe. That's why you can have it out on your shelf for years and nothing happens because there's too much sugar. Right. Um, but the bacteria are all transmitted, you know, basically from frass or feces within the hive to mm -hmm. new bees that are emerging within the same hive. Um, and you know, they, some of the bacteria definitely rely on nutrients present in nectar um, or honey, if that's what they're, they're ingesting within the hive, um, but they're not transmitted via the honey. Um, and the same goes for pollen. And I know that there might, you know, there's a lot of interest in like taking bee supplements and probiotics and stuff. And there's a lot of uh, mm -hmm. mysteries surrounding. <laughs> Royal jelly for yeah. everyone. Whenever yes. I tell anyone that I work on microbiomes, the immediate next question is about probiotics and whether they should take them and what kinds and that kind of thing. So um, I try to I try to avoid it, but it, it it's inevitable. Yeah, and if you eat too much of the royal jelly, I think you start to transform into a queen bee. <laughs> I think that in it so should be careful because of your microbiome. You have too much. If you have too much. <laughs> yeah, or if you're a fan of Futurama, you might assume that you'd start hallucinating or go to sleep forever. <laughs> it's also part of the lore now. I have never hallucinated from honey, royal jenny, jelly, any, but anyway. You just haven't had enough. <laughs> I obviously have not had enough. Jeez. It's all that sugar, all that stuff. What do you wish that... Um, that people like people are asking you these questions, but as somebody who works on microbiomes and specifically the in these insects, what do you wish people understood about how, um, I guess, how insects interact with the environment and their microbiome? Um, oh, that's that's a really really good question. Um, I think it's mainly the diversity. I think even within. Uh, like a, among a lot of biologists, we don't often appreciate how diverse insects are in so many ways. So even within bees, because um, you know I work on bees now, so um, I, I'm always uh, kind of harping on the difference between honeybees and all of the 20,000 wild bees that are out there. So there's this huge diversity of bees that are kind of get swept under the rug when we just think about honeybees. And so that applies to all sorts of things um, about their biology, but also their, their microbes. And so I think we often generalize, uh, this is my microbiome soapbox, um, from like humans to all mammals or from um, say termites to all insects or what have you, but there's so much diversity out there and there could be really important, maybe subtle differences even among different species because of what they eat or whether they're social or, or, or whatnot. Um, and so I think that that's kind of like a big challenge is to um, 
kind of understand the species specific interactions with um, microbes. And, you know, it's really important for like all of these insects are declining, including a lot of pollinators. Um, and so we really need to understand their specific biology and whether there, there's any kind of relationship with microbes. We know that um, in honeybees, uh, their gut microbes are sensitive to certain chemicals in the environment, like um, the herbicide glyphosate. Yeah. So whether that applies to other bees, who knows, you know, but um, yeah. I think, yeah, it, we, we just, we look at nature and we think it's just, every, it, it looks pretty, but it's just there. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's changing. It's changing very quickly. So. It's changing very rapidly. And I mean, from the, you know, once again, very human centric perspective, we look at stuff and it's like, oh, antibiotic resistance, and we shouldn't be uh, spreading antibiotics around what kind of effect are they going to have on the environment? And you think of it all in terms of just humans, mm -hmm. or the animals that we eat. And mm -hmm. but it's interesting to think that there could potentially be varying degrees of effects on, on mm -hmm. ecosystems as a result right. of the the varying mm -hmm. um, amount that different animals depend on them. Right. Yeah, totally. And then, you know, it makes it kind of, it makes everything more complicated and difficult to extrapolate. So maybe that's why we don't do it so much, but I think that it's really important. Mm -hmm. Do you ever yeah. feel bad for nutritionists? <laughs> over like people who wrote books on nutrition uh they, 20 years ago 10 years ago <laughs> they do seem to have a tough job and my reading is that it's always changing their recommendations and like the latest science um and also the like kind of the realization that the gut microbiome the human gut microbiome this being this kind of forgotten organ that's critical to our nutrition um that's definitely changing i mean it should change how we see our nutrition because we do have to feed our gut microbes in addition to just ourselves. Um, so, I, I mean, it's, it seems like it would be an exciting time to be a nutritionist, at least if you're working on gut microbiome if stuff. Yeah. Right, but if you're trying to sell books, then you'd have to <laughs> oh, say, well, okay, yeah. this is the, the plan for if you have this particular subset oh, of yeah. bacteria in your right. stomach. So go get your poop <laughs> yeah. check yeah. and then decide if this book is right for you. Right, right, right. Yeah, and, very highly personalized recommendation. Very personalized. But then but then the, the, the follow-up to that is, is there a possibility with, uh, with uh, the field that you're following within the insect community microbiome that we mm. could get a new a proper microbiota nutritionist book out for uh pollinators oh that would yes. encourage farmers mm. to somehow seed fields with the right probiotic for these mm. well that's that i really like that idea um I mean, certainly like it's hard enough getting the right kind of flowering plants to be available, mm -hmm. much less any kind mm -hmm. of probiotic bacteria. And of course, if you think about uh, like spraying, you know, bacteria out in the field, that's going to be all sorts of regulations and complications there. It seems hard enough to even just get the right, you know, flowers that, that we know bees like and do well on mm -hmm. that. That's like kind of the first challenge, I suppose probiotics are the next level right but maybe it's not it's it's the the prebiotic the prebiotic I, thing mm -hmm. the prebiotic so it's not the it's not the actual bacteria that you're spraying on the right. field but it is the it is the environment is <laughs> right. making the environment suitable to the, yeah. for the right kinds of bacteria <laughs> yeah. yeah and that could totally be happening we're like we're just kind of getting a glimpse into that. So one example is that there's this new, really exciting work being done showing that sunflower pollen in particular makes bumblebees much more resistant to a par this particular parasite that's like all over the US and infecting lots of different bumblebees and stuff. And so one idea is that the sunflower pollen in particular is a prebiotic that supports mm -hmm. their bumblebees beneficial gut bacteria then then protect yeah. the bee from the parasite right so that's kind of this is all like currently being done right now um but that's one example of you know where it could lead in the future for sure i love it 
sunflowers, <laughs> sunflower pollen for the bumblebees, who <laughs> get other flowers for the honeybees, and then the 20,000 it... other right. <laughs> wild bees. <laughs> right. <laughs> they each get their own specialized nutritionist. Right. Although <laughs> I, I, I am not totally certain that all of those other bees have much of a gut microbiome, mm -hmm. but the jury is still out there. But I will. And I'd be curious to see if they were uh, that different if they are if they're uh, pollinating similar things uh, isn't mm. the isn't the honeybee sort of a, a hybrid i mean it's a result of uh animal husbandry uh, at this yeah. point the 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 bee that we have is a honey the honeybee that we use uh, in agriculture it's an import it's out of its natural environment right. it's, been, it's sort of a hybrid so it uh maybe part of the reason it's uh it it's it would be so different than the wild bee yeah, it's certainly like, you know, the cow of the bee world. It's like livestock. Um exactly. at least in the, at least in the in the US here where it is non-native, it's imported. Um and yet we've been managing for so long. We've been doing all sorts of things that probably affect their honeybee gut microbes. Yeah. Like antibiotic treatment, for example, um has been a pretty common practice just like spray tetracycline on your hives to wow. treat particular bacterial pathogens. Yeah. So of course, we, it, w there is evidence now that that has um, resulted in antibiotic resistance genes <laughs> popping up in their gut bacteria. Mm -hmm. So there's clearly effects on the gut bacteria and whether other, other um, things that we expose honeybees to, like I mentioned, the herbicide glyphosate, um, or which is part of Roundup, yeah. um, you know, we, there's probably lots of, of similar things like that, yeah. Uh, you described it as the cow of the of the bee world, but mm -hmm. the, but I've, I've heard it described uh, as more like a, a poodle versus a wolf in mm. terms of robustness, <laughs> okay. and ability to uh. survive on its own. Maybe more like a Dalmatian. I don't. Know. We've, yeah, we've got, we you know in <laughs> in really in, like a bulldog because they. <laughs> <laughs> They've been okay, now, the point where they can't do their job anymore. But the, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, but, but so, so we have we've sort of, in a way, maybe uh, hindered some of their natural ability to survive in the wild uh, by by selecting traits that were beneficial for our for our for sort of short term specific mm -hmm. short term and human, you know, right. uh, uh, many many generations right. <laughs> short term benefit. Right. Uh, it's like the banana. Like the oh yeah, man has survived just fine on their own though. <laughs> but yeah, you you know you do see a lot of feral honeybee colonies popping up, so they're they're not they're not quite banana level. So that might be, <laughs> wouldn't that be wouldn't that be though that that wouldn't be that be an interesting place to then uh, look for uh, maybe what is a beneficial if if they're able to survive on their own in the wild in the environment and adapt to the environment. They may have some uh, pretty good clues in, in their microbiome if they're if they're differing from the uh, from a, a a a domestically kept or husbanded what is it cultivated uh, hive cultivated yeah yeah um, yeah I, I'm not sure if anyone has really compared like you know feral colonies to managed colonies per se there have been a lot of studies of like all around the world um, of the of Apis mellifera the species. Mm -hmm. Um, and they do all pretty much have the same eight species of core bacteria. But whether there's more going on within those bacteria, like I mentioned, antibiotic resistance genes um, popping up in places where, uh, in the U.S., where beekeepers had been using, uh, mm -hmm. applying antibiotics. Those are kind of more subtle things that you don't get just by kind of surveying what species are there. We have to dig into the particular the genomes of those species to know what's going on so there may be more kind of interesting diversity that's hidden among all these different honeybee populations yeah and as you said it's a, the, the social aspect of them too uh kind of keeps the the same the same population going throughout the generation yeah so, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. it might not be uh, right it might not be any different yeah right we don't want to keep you up too late tonight. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. Um, oh, is there, yeah, yeah, what is it? Did this leave us with um, a teaser for whatever, um, like the current stuff that you're working on that you're the big question that you're that you're asking right now? 
Yeah, so um, so I'm working on uh, bee gut microbiomes, and I'm, I'm interested in whether their bacteria constrain bee ability to respond to climate change. Mm -hmm. So we mentioned these like costs and benefits, and one cost that we didn't talk about is that sometimes the bacteria can be more sensitive to environmental stressors than the animal. And so some bacteria are really heat sensitive. And so if you are an animal that relies on a bacterium that's heat sensitive, then you are now heat sensitive. So I'm kind of looking at whether that is playing out in bees in a nutshell. Very interesting. We'll be keeping an eye on your work to see what comes out of it. Great. This has been really great. If people do want to keep up with you and uh, what you're doing, how can they do that? Where so, can they find you? Yeah, so uh, my check out my website, uh, tobinhammer.com. Um, I'm on Twitter, Toby underscore Hammer. Um, feel free to get in touch with me. I'd be happy to chat more about insects, microbiomes. Yeah. Yeah, it just blew my mind with the last one. I hadn't even occurred uh, to me at all the, the, the temperature sensitivity uh -huh. in the light of global warming as being an intense pressure. Yeah. Uh, that's wild. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'd love, I, we probably don't have too much time, but I would. No, we have time. I oh. just don't want to keep you up too late. <laughs> oh, so well, if you would like to. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll just say, just to, to like um, expand on that a little bit. So there's this cool paper that came out about the stink bug, which is uh, this particular uh, stink bug called the southern green stink bug. It, like a lot of these other insects we talked about, is one of those that's critically reliant on bacterial symbiont. And it turns out that the bacterial symbiont is much more sensitive to heat than the bug itself is. And so what these researchers in Japan did was they reared the insects at a, like a projected climate change scenario um, like just a couple degrees Celsius, Celsius elevated. And what happens is that kills the symbiont and then the insect is no longer getting those nutritional benefits and needs from the bacterium and then it dies. Hmm. So it's not that the stink bug is heat sensitive, but it's reliant on these heat sensitive bacteria. And so that might be a really common phenomenon. It might constrain the abilities of insects to adapt. So, you know, this kind of... Mm -hmm it's kind of unclear, you know, with global warming, how, how able um, will organisms be to evolve higher uh, temperature tolerance? Um, how quickly are they able to do that to track warming? They may be more able to do that if they don't rely on symbionts, if they're like mm -hmm. a caterpillar or one of these other organisms where it's just, it just has itself to worry about as opposed to worrying about this partner that it relies on that may have a very different physiology and maybe way more heat sensitive or, or, or cold sensitive, et cetera. Um, so that's kind of this interesting cost yeah, in an evolutionary yeah. way. Everybody was laughing at the caterpillar for never having uh, yeah. on a microwave. Right. Well, who's laughing now, <laughs> yeah. baby? Right? I mean, but now I'm now I'm thinking, I'm like, I, how can we put some of these heat sensitive microbes into mosquitoes, into ticks, right, right, right. into all of the all of the bugs that are spreading that we don't the disease right. spreading ones that we don't want to see. And there's this hidden around. time bomb yeah. because we don't know we don't know how much of the food chain uh, could disappear uh, over right, exactly. over a few degrees. I mean, that becomes a very concerning. Yeah. Uh, I element. mean, yeah, especially with you know the the insect apocalypse getting a lot of att right. attention, which you know it's not really an apocalypse per se, but there are a lot of very concerning declines going on, and so it is uh, like it will be a very important element to look at how microbes play into which insects and their declines and whether we can tweak those microbes to mm -hmm. sustain them under different kinds of stressors, chemical stressors, heat stresses, etc. Because that is a nice aspect of these microbiomes that isn't the case with like insect genes is that we can manipulate them more easily, like with probiotics or with prebiotics, um, where we can kind of fine tune the microbiome um, in kind of desired ways. So that's kind of a, a nice aspect is that they're a little bit, we can tinker with them a little bit more easily than with, uh, attributes that are encoded in the insect's own genome. So. Yeah.
And thanks to horizontal gene transfer between mm. bacteria, mm -hmm. the same mechanism that leads to the antibiotic resistance, mm -hmm. you can potentially get these get these various tinkered with genes to spread very right. easily, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So potential concerns, but um, yeah, could be used to our advantage, I suppose. Yeah. It's fast. It's fascinating. It's very interesting. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. This yeah, is really, it was really cool great, stuff. Great being on the program, chatting with you all. Um, but yeah, so anyone feel free to get in touch um, if you have any questions or want to chat more. Thank you so much for your time tonight. This has just been really great. Got a chance to blow Justin's mind a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like terrified now. Yeah, but something I was never even on the horizon before. <laughs> Great. All right, everybody. Okay. Thank I'm you so up. much, Tobin. Everyone, okay. Dr. Tobin Hammer from U of Texas at Austin. See y'all later. Thank you. Good night. Good night. And everyone else, we are going to take a quick break. We'll be coming back, coming round the break when we do, when we do. <laughs> That's right. We'll be back in just a few moments with more This Week in Science. Stay tuned. <laughs> Explain the things you've heard with more than intuition. A line of reason shows the way to go. A new conclusion. The methods of hypothesis and patience are the only things I need. Put on a pair of goggles and go looking for the things I couldn't see. Hello, thank you so much for supporting us by being here with us, joining us for another episode of This Week in Science. If you want to get Christmas presents for your friends that are twist related, oh, that's right. Right now, you should head over to the twist website. Twist.org is where you can find a link to buy the 2020 calendar. That's right. This Week in Science has a calendar for 2020. Blair has made wonderful stained glass themed art with new animals for you to peruse each month. Each month. Wow. She's also putting on a costume right now. Wow. I don't know what's going on over there. Skeleton earrings and a big helmet. Okay. I think she's in Star Wars. <laughs> Do you have a TIE fighter? I don't know if you have a TIE fighter. No, that's the wrong side. I'm, I'm flying oh. an X-Wing. Oh, you're flying an X-Wing. Okay, yes. thanks. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know which side I'm you're part on, of Blair. The fire or something. Get out of here. <laughs> I don't know which side you're on. Ha <laughs> ha. Twist.org, click on the frog link. It's not a hypnotoad. It is a horned frog. And horned frog. that's right. Twist 2020, click on the link. It'll take you to a PayPal interface where you can buy a calendar. Get them now. We're going to be ordering them soon. And I look forward to sending you yours before the holidays. I really do look forward to that. There's also our Zazzle store. If you haven't been to the Zazzle store before, the Zazzle store is full of all sorts of wonderful twist goodies. Shirts, tote bags, pillows, hats, all sorts of wonderful things. Peruse it. Find some twist goodies. Support twists while you do your shopping for the holidays. It would be really fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. And finally, also Patreon at our twist website. The Patreon link is where you can support us in an ongoing fashion, donating uh, once a month at a level of your choosing. Choose your level of support. $10 and more a month will allow you to be thanked on the show every week. And finally, one more go round for, hey, Team Trees. Head over to teamtrees.org if you would like to be involved 
in planting trees. 20 million trees is the goal. And right now it's at 10 million. 216,777 a dollar per tree for the Arbor Foundation. It's going to be great. Going to be great. I think it's time for us to go back into our show. That's enough messaging. I do believe. I do believe I've told you enough. Thank you so much for your support. We really could not do any of this without you. <laughs> Explain things you've heard with more than intuition. A line of reason shows the way to go. New conclusion. The methods are hypothesis and And we're back. You're listening to This Week in Science. Yeah, we're back again with our science. We have so much. We do. We that do, we do. is an awesome costume. Oh, thank I'm you. So <laughs> Had to do a little bit of twist a ween here. <laughs> I figured I'd put on a costume after because all we have uh, are scary. All we have are scary masks around here this year. <laughs> yeah, for those listening, uh, 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 Blair is in a red team uh, helmet from uh, Star Wars. Yeah, ready, I'm red uh, five. Fighter. ready to ready to go take down the Death Star, no yeah. doubt. Yeah. Go red five. That's a five. But right now it is time for this weekend. What has science done for me? Lately. Lately. Well, this letter this week starts. Hi, Dr. Kiki Blair and even Justin. Oh, oh, thank, oh, oh why, thank you. darn! Why, hey, this is a good start. That's a great okay, start. You have my Here. attention. <laughs> That's a burn. Need some sap for that burn, Justin. <laughs> Here's what science has done for me lately. I'm of the vintage where there was no MMR vaccine when I was a child, and like most of my age group, I had at least two or three of those now uncommon thanks to vaccine illnesses. I had the measles when I was very young, and I had an extremely high fever while my adult teeth were forming. And due to this, I have very fragile teeth. When I was 13 or 14, both of my front lower teeth were broken, and I had to have them crowned. Oh, no. That is Back rough then, for a kid. Yeah, late 70s, early 80s. Having teeth crowned was a six to eight week process of grinding teeth, taking molds, sending off molds, waiting for someone to hand cast and shape the crown, then having it installed over several visits to the dentist. Hmm. Fast forward to earlier this year when I cracked a tooth and I had to have a root canal and another crown. This time, the tooth was scanned by the dentist with a hand scanner to model the existing tooth and how it fit with the rest of my teeth. The tooth was ground to shape. Another scan was taken. And within 30 minutes, a new crown was computer cast and shaped in the dentist's office and installed in the same visit. No waiting six to eight weeks with a temporary crown that prevented me from eating many foods, else it might come off. No repeat visits to the dentist. One crown ten years ago took four visits because it wasn't made correctly. Oh, and it's that time when we lose Kiki. Uh, but the, uh, So we'll hear the rest of the story in a second. But I will say, uh, these teeth, one of them is not for real. And it wasn't uh, as quick as this. This is, this is new stuff. Uh, my, my last one, I did have to have the temporary and then I got this one, uh, but it was, it was still a pretty quick, it wasn't a weeks long process. It was two visits instead of, you know, weeks and weeks and weeks and months of this. Uh, but they even, yeah. you can't tell which one it is. Cause even with my yellow teeth, they color matched it. Yes. The color matching is amazing. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Should I, should I, did you finish the letter? No, uh, no, 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 I'll no, finish, no, no. Let me finish I, I, the letter. Yep. I don't have it in front of me, so... Uh, so All right, I, I'll, it, yeah. I'll, I'll just finish the letter very quickly. Thanks. When did I, when did I freeze? Oh, uh, right when uh, the, the last time it was crown 30 10 minutes. years ago used to take four yes. visits. Yes, one crown 10 years ago took four visits because it wasn't made correctly when it was sent out. 
thanks to scientific advances in 3D scanning, modeling, and modeling, I was able to have a broken tooth fixed in just one short visit. Thank That's you, science, awesome. from Jim. I can't wait to lose my next tooth now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, that's really encouraging. That's, that's an awesome experience. Yeah, it'll still hurt. <laughs> it will. I don't well, think thank they've you, taken Jim. the pain out of dentistry yet. They have not taken all the pain out, but it is definitely it is definitely getting friendlier and better. Yeah. It's pretty it's amazing. definitely better. Absolutely. And so, yes, I hope m more people are less afraid of these 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 routines at the dentist i hope you know although to be fair my, I'm a, on that crown i got i did something happened i got uh must have gotten poked in the cheek i got an infection my face swelled up like a balloon and i had like 104 fever so oh no Shh. it was pretty convenient people. process other than that <laughs> no Shh. What? but he's alive today because of modern medicine so there that's you go. right that i had antibiotics right. that worked Thank goodness. Those were the days. Oh, oh my God. Remember, we need you to write in with your story of what a science has done for you lately. I want to read your story on the show. Please write in. Send me an email. Kirsten, K-I-R-S-T-E-N at thisweekinscience.com or leave us a message on our Facebook page. I need your letters. Send them in. It can even be a short one. It could be a sonnet. It could be all sorts of things. Send them in. <sighs> okay. Before Justin goes to sleep, we should get some stories in here. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. So let's jump in with my first terrifying story of the night. It's terrifying. <sighs> Off in a galaxy far, far away. Oh, no, it wasn't oh, no. a galaxy. It was a computer server, and it was, it was taken over by an AI, an artificially intelligent algorithm. Is this the one that writes screenplays or what? No, no, no. This one beats everybody at StarCraft II. <laughs> if you oh, okay. If you know StarCraft II, StarCraft II is a it's a battle game. There are three groups of beings: the Proteans, the Terrans, and uh, I'm probably I'm forgetting the other one. But anyway, there's three groups of beings, and you can play as any one of them against the other two groups. And you you it's a strategy game, and you have resources that you need to manage to be able to. Oh, the Zerg. Thank you. Thank you, Schnago. The Zerg. Yes. But you have resources and you have to build things and take over land and you have to battle against the other forces. You have to grow your forces. There's all sorts of things that come into account. And apparently it's so complicated that there's some 10 to the 24 or 10 to the 26 possible moves at any one decision point in the game. Every time it's your turn, there's 10 to the 24 possibilities. And so DeepMind, the Google-based company that made the artificial intelligence that bested the best Go players and chess players in the world, has created a new artificial intelligence that is named Alpha Star. Alpha Star uh, is trained, self-trained, and okay. Uh, so this is this was uh, this is the thing I was going to ask. Uh, yeah. But this is uh, oh, okay. Alpha so they Star set was... out goals for it, uh, achievement mm -hmm. markers to like, okay, do this. This was a good result. Yes. But it had to go through the motions. It had to go through the motions, and initially, oh, you know, it just nice. played the game by itself self playing against itself um so it uh it it started getting better and better and eventually they let it out onto a real starcraft 2 game server and they invited players and this was a server in in europe somewhere and they invited uh starcraft 2 players to play against the ai and try and beat it and initially when they did this 
Alpha Star beat everybody because they didn't limit its possible its its game speed. And so the decisions it was making and the the speed at which it could make moves was faster than any human could possibly. Yeah. Mm. So do that anything. was that was another question I had. It's like, wouldn't it, isn't uh, isn't it one of those things? Like if you if you're clicking faster, remember to update all your yes. clickety clacks over here. You got a yes. thing building. You got to click that thing. And yeah, which is why and I can't so play question. those games. They just cause anxiety. Yeah, so the question was, like, I mean, if you're just clicking faster, then are you just winning because you're clicking faster, or are you winning because you're better and making better strategy decisions? So they handicapped the AI and made it more human speed, and then they put it back out again, and it... uh, it, it didn't win all the games, and but it did end up becoming grandmaster status. It uh, it it beat like ninety nine point eight percent of the people that it competed against, but it didn't beat everybody. There were still some humans who did better, uh, and so uh, Google is saying we did it. We beat StarCraft too, but there are some other researchers that have come out and said, "Well, you didn't beat everybody." And do you really know that you made all the right, that this AI made all like the really strategic moves? Are there no more weaknesses to the AI strategy? And so they're saying that maybe it's not quite to the level of the AlphaGo AI that, that beat the Go game, that maybe there are still some improvements that need to be made. But for in all intents and purposes, strategy games are uh, falling to AI. And so the point of this is to build robots that can handle strategy, right? That's the that's the like overarching, not just like, hey, we want to mess with video games. This is like the actual goal of this, right? Is to develop strategy systems in AI. Yeah, so do you remember uh-huh. last week we talked with uh, Melanie Mitchell and she talked about uh, brittleness in AI and AI not being able to transfer their abilities from one instance to something different. And that is what they're aiming for by increasing the strategic complexity of the situations that they're putting the AIs in. DeepMind thinks that they will get closer and closer to creating a more generalized intelligence. And yeah, that's, I, that's the goal. So and, making and, a more and, ag- agile <laughs> intelligence. And so so the the next the next level of this would would it would be um, because in that self-learning mode, first of all, you have to have a complex set of moves available. Uh, there was a uh, movie once, what was it? Uh, Shall we play a game? Was yes, the War and Games. It, and War Games, thank you. With yeah, and Matthew they Broderick. Took, they, Matthew Broderick took down the supercomputer uh, by making it play uh, tic-tac-toe against itself. Yeah. And it kept getting like, ah, there's no way of winning this game. It, it, and it eventually destroyed the computer. It had a meltdown. Uh, but, right, because but, so, playing against itself, it was just playing against itself and all the decisions couldn't, it was yeah, making. Yeah, couldn't win. It was showing that there was a no was a, a lose lose situation. So so in the 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 thing I'm trying to picture is in the version of it where it's playing itself. Mm. Uh yeah. I could see taking very narrow bandwidths of strategy back and forth. You know, um I don't mm-hmm. I don't know the the game, but if it was like I can if I just build enough mining craft and crash them into the other team eventually you know after a million moves of this once i I can win but so then if you had you need two of these ais coming up with competitive strategies that then go against each other so it would have to be Mm -hmm. siloed like two brain like playing a mirror of itself right right? and so Uh, what they what they ended up doing is they uh it's not specifically self-play for this exact like it's not just playing itself and learning from itself and only like I can't beat myself. Mm-hmm. What they uh, did is they created these siloed instances that are like different versions of itself, but that were were programmed to be um, exploiters and to find weaknesses. And so okay. um, the there's the one main 
alpha star who that was looking for particular strategies and would go towards particular strategies, but then the exploiters would come in. And so, and that would, instead of the uh, alpha star becoming very narrow in its ability, it would end up having to, uh, having to, I guess, be more robust in its ability to defend against certain attacks. Yeah. And so, and, yeah, that was the idea. Yeah, no, that makes absolute sense. And, and then, and then, so when we're talking about transferring this ability, uh, it's, uh, I still don't see where this becomes a real world thing when we're talking about applying it to uh, biology in sense, where there needs to be this physical world interaction that has its own physical realities. I, I still don't see, I, I, again, I'm just being limited in my vision maybe, but, uh, what I do see is probably the quickest, highest, best use of this would be in hacking. Mm -hmm. uh, would be applied to cybersecurity or right. a cyber offensive technology because it's programming versus programming. It's it's probing for weaknesses in other programming in other. Um, so that would probably be the, the thing that would be the easiest for me to imagine it being applied to in our in a, our real world would be still locked into a digital space. Uh, I don't. Yeah. I don't know. I'm sure this kind of AI, you know, it's going to be applied to the economy. It's going to be applied to uh, scientific pursuits. It'll be applied. Yeah, there are probably very many ways that these kinds of things will be applied in the future. For now, games, chess, go, StarCraft 2. That's where we're at. Uh, moving on, uh, in other really interesting news, let's talk about brains because it's brains. Halloween. And, brains. And one day we all may be mind controlled zombies. Um, aren't we already with our cell yeah. phones? <laughs> yeah. But imagine if instead of having to pick up your cell phone to talk mm -hmm. to somebody, um, they could just communicate right into your brain or even, you know, get you to do things. Just from their brain to your brain. What if all of our brains could be connected where instead of having our little fingers tippity topping on the keyboards and having to look into a camera and look at a screen to talk to each other, what if we just existed connected to each other's brains? Oh, no. Like, Everyone would yes. know what I was thinking all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's That's not terrifying. good. It's terrifying, uh, isn't it? Your search engine already does. <laughs> I mean, I don't type everything into the search engine. Not everything. Well, researchers just published a new study in Scientific Reports in which they report the first time ever that multiple brains have been connected directly brain to brain interfaces they without invasiveness so no implants necessary they used external eegs where they picked up brain activity from the uh, outside of the brain and took those brain signals and they were uh, they were translated into a computer the computer then translated the signal sent it to another person where it was then translated into a transcranial magnetic stimulation pulse that uh, would turn on a phosphine, which is in essence a, a burst of light. It gets one of the cells in your retina to burst with light. So it leaves a little visual signal. And by doing this signal, then the... Uh, the receiver of information would then think about what that meant and uh, solve a puzzle in a particular way based on the answers that they had gotten. So they, they played a Tetris-like game, and the senders were looking at the game. The receivers were looking at the same game, but it's at the bottom of the screen in the game of Tetris where you have, like, the hole that's there and you got to figure it out, the receivers could not see what the little puzzle piece was falling down to fill. And so it was the sender's job to send the signal of mm. whether or not the puzzle piece that was falling from the top of the screen needed to be flipped over or not. And so the phosphine sig signal was signaling either a burst of light that meant, yes, flip it, or there was no 
burst of light, no phosphine, and the receiver should then not flip huh. the puzzle piece. Anyway, it worked. They were able to, the receivers received over 85% accuracy. The signals were transmitted from brain to brain and from not just brain, but brain to computer to brain to computer with all of this EEG and transmagnetic stimulation. It's still just a very simple signal. It's a yes or no pulse. It's binary. So if you wanted to send any more complicated information, it would take a very long time. <laughs> it would be a lot more difficult. Um, but it is the uh, proof of concept, they say, to this idea that one day we may be able to connect brain to brain to communicate. And, and if yeah. it was the real true brain to brain connection for Tetris, you would also be communicating the stress of when you <laughs> accidentally rotate it the wrong like, way right, right before it hits. And then you've covered up the hole and, uh oh, now they're coming faster. And, uh -oh. uh. <laughs> uh, and the other thing then too is uh, based on the, the story you just did, if you have an algorithm that can play the game, uh mm -hmm. you can have it sending a signal you don't actually need the uh, the first brain is actually not necessary or you could you could uh you could essentially have that communication take place over time so here's an interesting thing then you it would be one way of course but you would have you could see i'm thinking you could record something with your brain that you could give to a a great 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 grandchild to receive but on the other hand you can write a letter. You can make yeah, a you video. Can you can, I, mean, I we was have thinking more that like, you know how how um, athletes could be caught juicing. Uh, gamers could be caught uh, using a brain to machine connection to AI to play the game for them. Oh, brilliant. Mm. Yeah. Although Just a little might... pair of Google yeah. goggles or something like this. Yeah. Uh, tie it into faster. the uh, AI. And yeah. The I and then if it's even the if you get it to accentuate the, your choices mm -hmm. and we had the one where it, you could make uh, somebody you could send the electrical signal or where a finger makes somebody else's finger move at a different university then even your clicking uh, can be taken <laughs> over yes. by a computer that's making your you just you're just along for the ride at that point yeah. you're just yeah. getting credit for you're the getting computers. You're, you're being told what to do by the computer and doing what the computer tells you which so we already big... do with other humans though other we humans do. get us clicking things and have mm -hmm. us doing work and job stuff and one aspect to this study which i thought was uh, i'm i'm questioning the need for them to do it was the last step in which they took the response of the receiving person and after receiving the transmit cranial magnetic stimulation the, that person needed to tell the game whether to flip it over or not and instead of having them reach out and hit a button to do that again they transmitted they they recorded an eeg to turn it into a computer signal so the brain told the computer what to do Mm. It. I really don't see the need for that, aside from you know, pe potentially being able to communicate back and forth with with people who are locked in, or uh, potentially with people who have uploaded their consciousness to computers. Um, you know, why, why turn it into a fully digital signal as opposed to have the person just reach out and hit a button. So because I would assume it's because they, they don't want cheating because it's just like when you have the hearing test at school and you don't yeah, hear they anything, know what but the you're like, doing. Uh, yeah, it's been a while. Know. There's probably a sound. I'm going to raise my hand anyway. No, I think true. I think if you're watching it yeah. and you're like, uh, I just put that over there. I think this has to go over here. You might make a decision whether you felt anything or not. Maybe. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just, I, the way it sounded to me is this, uh, it actually hurts the experiment because then I'm, my first thought was that you just created the, used the brain as a circuit. Yes. And, the brain and the is mini area as a, con, not even a, as a conduit for the signal. Yeah. Hmm. The, so the other aspect of the study that I think, again, is interesting is uh, this 
idea, it comes from some animal studies in which uh, other researchers have networked rat brains and monkey brains. And in the case of the networked rat brains, the uh, the animals ended up working, uh, solving a problem more efficiently together than they did on their own. So it was uh, basically more brains were smarter together. And I kind of go, well, isn't that already what happens when we have people working together in groups? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Isn't that what happens when people actually do stuff together on the internet? Some cool stuff happens. I mean, there's a lot of dumb stuff on the internet, but it, well, there's the, a carrying capacity, is, right? Like we've talked about that on the show that there's there's a group of people where you get smarter yeah. and you get smarter and you get smarter and eventually there's too many and then you actually be you make worse and worse decisions the more people are involved. But then there's also the uh, the, the prediction markets where they are using the betting right. of lots of people betting to actually predict the outcomes of various things. And they're very accurate a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. So it's a question of whether mm -hmm. it's a bunch of people making their own decisions and you average those decisions or you ask a bunch of people in one place to make a shared decision. Yeah. And I think that's what's really different is that, yeah, if you're just crowdsourcing answers, it does get better with numbers. But if you have mm -hmm. any cooperative stuff going on, it, it has a it has a a, a drop off. Yeah. I just I just wonder if there if, if it, it has to be brain to brain to mm -hmm. computer or you know, <laughs> I'm like why? Why? Uh, Sorry, just, you can cut the human out of it completely. And and also I think I think those studies uh on on consensus uh, decision making. It just all depends on the expertise of the people who uh, are involved. So, so it's it's if you have a bunch of the world's uh, leading uh, fill in the blank uh, cut researchers, people who have studied a thing, history, physics doesn't quite matter, and and you have them uh, give you predictive models of the outcome of sports ball events. You, you've taken them outside of their expertise. No, but perhaps. that's the thing of that. That's the thing about these these uh, about these prediction markets is it doesn't have it doesn't matter if they're experts or not. It's just the wisdom of the crowd, mm -hmm. and it it's people can it, all sorts of people voting together somehow create this very accurate estimate. And yeah. it's, well, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. it is the financial market predictions are a no better than a. A coin flip. Yeah, uh, right. When you Elections, when taken on hold, they they, pre they predict all sorts of things. You should they look into everything. it. You would be fascinated. Depends on who you're listening to in the financial yeah. markets. They predict yeah. everything, and the end result has been a, pretty much a coin flip. Yeah. But anyway, I, this brain to brain, scary for Twistaween. Mm. Tell you, oh, Justin, what do you have? Tell me a story. I okay. <clears throat> if you are a human. Or as we've talked, maybe an insect too. Most insects. Some insects. We've still got to figure it out. Uh, you have bacteria. Some good, some bad, some utterly indifferent to your health. And you have them lots of places. They're under here. They're under there. They're all over your body. But for the most part, they go unnoticed. However, if you yourself were a bacteria, you would really notice the other bacteria because they would be everywhere. Other bacteria are constantly invading your space. Uh, the micro world is full, every niche. And so there's competition uh, amongst bacteria just to survive. And a new society is now suggesting that gut microbiota, gut bacteria, acquire a sort of unique defensive arsenal against a type of a, to a toxic assault uh, that would come about by their neighboring microbes. What's really, really interesting to me about this is it's... Uh, okay, so this is a quotey voice of the, the project scientist. Diet and immune response are not enough to explain the constituents of their gut microbiome. Uh, the, uh, the victors of struggles and hostilities among microorganisms attempting to reside in the gut may contribute to the makeup of that microbial community. 
So basically what this is going into is that the, the microbes in your gut are themselves coming up with antibiotics against their neighbors, or at least resistances to the attacks from their neighbors that mm. were normally designed to destroy other bacteria. This becomes then an immunity factor in the body for invasive species, uh, where if you look at if you look at a microbial community, even though they're very diverse and you find all sorts of microbes everywhere, they like to sort of hang out in communities just amongst themselves as much as possible. In the gut, that's not possible. You have to coexist. It's a big city, uh, so. The findings suggest that these immunity genes that they, f they found, and this is B. fragilis, uh, and other samples, uh, the immunity, they found these immunity genes appeared at substantially higher abundance uh, than in, the, in that particular species. So, based on observation, scientists think that immunity genes have an adaptive role because they help bacteria overcome toxic hits from other assailants. Uh, this sort of shielding effect during growth in a petri dish in their labs, and when introduced, and when they introduced the bacteria carrying these genes into the guts of mice, followed. So we have we have our own uh, we have our own immune system that we've kind of known about antibodies and the like. The bacteria in our guts have their own defenses against yeah. the rest of their community. And somewhere in there is this balance that allows our microbiota uh, to persist and to continue to exist. I just got a vision of it, an image in my head of these. It's like a Russian nesting doll of, yes. <laughs> you know, of, of immune systems and defenses. <laughs> Here's my box of tricks. Well, I've got a box of tricks inside your box of tricks. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, but, but uh, one of the one of the sort of interesting things though is we talk about antibiotic resistance quite a bit, and, and it, because this is uh, you know from the way they're being applied uh, on a macro scale, we're going to see some pretty disastrous effects of this. Our own gut microbes are in a constant state of defending themselves and adapting to uh, and creating anti. Uh, antibiotic resistance from other other biotics. Yeah. Right. So this is part of why we don't easily uh, obtain diseases from food. This is, a, this is sort of an interesting thing from the uh, conversation we had that a lot of the microbiome that we have is not from anything that we're eating. They're from social uh, interactions within families. This is kind of an interesting thing that uh, that is that is. More recent revelation when we have had twin studies that showed there wasn't genetic causes to things, but also that those twin studies within families found that having dissimilar diets also didn't affect the microbiome that much. It's just the hugs and kisses and sleeping in the you know same beds or uh, being uh, on the same couch all day. It has that social effect mm -hmm. of spreading uh, the microbiome. But our microbiome becoming and maintaining its own antibiotic resistance to the rest of its biota is creating this sort of happy medium. But still warfare, still adaptation yeah. is taking place. Yeah, and it's constantly developing. It's that that constant movement of this. I mean, one one adaptation means the other species is going to have an adaptation that things are going to change constantly and it's con it's and then as that's changing our own body is potentially adapting to how it reacts potentially and but then you, you also sort of think about this in terms of our uh, how we share our microbes mm -hmm. and you can actually see how uh, there could be very big differences within families because it's the evolution that's going on in the defenses and, and why, why one family has this horrible allergy. Like everybody in this family has an allergy or can, is more prone to getting uh, a, right. a gastrointestinal uh, ailment uh, or, or, uh, whereas other families don't because they're not in a, the, those groups are not interacting. So in a way we are also having silos of 
of this evolution within groups of humans uh, all over the all over the world. And the more more friends we have, I, I suppose, the less siloed we are. Uh, but the more siloed you are, the less friends you have, the more fragile your your microbiome may eventually become. And Facebook friends don't count that unless does you not meet count. up in person you and to... lick common things. Yeah, or <laughs> lick common share, things. Share a glass of water is all. Oh, you don't yay. have to go much further. Maybe just shake hands. Yeah. Maybe that's it. Maybe just, just lick your hand first, though. Do that. Blair, I'm not coming anywhere near you next time I see you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I promised to dry my hand before. <laughs> oh, she's, I'm sure she's plenty healthy. She's ridden Bart <sighs> enough times. Lick your hand. That's High five true. for bacterial warfare. Yeah. Also, remember how clean I normally am and how grossed out I yeah. am by people who don't shower. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm taking that into account. Yeah. Show. Yeah. show. Well, that was themed up according to our microbial interview earlier. But Blair said she has some scary stories. Are we ready for those? Okay, it's time for Blair's Animal Corner. With Blair. She loves our creatures, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. You want to hear about animals, she's your girl, except for giant pandas and squirrels, and a What you got, Blair? Oh my goodness, I have rat-eating monkeys. That's Ooh. right, yes. There's a rat that eats monkeys? No, there's Ooh. monkeys that eat rats. Oh. This is in palm oil forests um so palm oil is the most wild widely consumed vegetable oil i'm sure you've heard about it in the environmental movement lately relating to orangutans and other animals that live in these same areas where they then will clear cut and plant palm oil trees um but there's a new friend in this conversation and that is the pigtailed macaque now, pigtailed macaques are known to be mostly frugivore, frugivores. That means they eat fruit mostly. Um, but it turns out uh, they thought they just occasionally feast on small birds or lizards, but there's actually quite a lot more meat in their diet than they thought. So there was a study looking at pigtailed macaques and their impacts on palm oil um, started in about 2013. And they found these guys eating rats. They uncovered cavities in oil palm trunks where rats seek shelter during the day. And then they just grab them out of these cavities. One group of pigtailed macaques can catch more than 3,000 rats in a year. That's a, that's a lot of rats. Um, so they actually found that macaque visitors, when there's a palm oil plantation that has a good number of macaque visitors, they can actually uh, reduce rat numbers by more than 75%, which is more effective than a lot of chemical pesticides trying to re remove rodents from a space. Hmm. Um, so the original thought actually was that macaques had a negative impact on palm oil because they eat palm fruit. Macaques eat more than 12 tons of oil palm fruits per year. But when you look at the percentage of palm oil production, that's about 0.56%. So half a percentage is going to palm oil fruits. On the opposite side, the rat the rats that they're eating cause losses of about 10% of production. So by eating rats, they're actually way outweighing the loss of the fruits that they eat. They think that that um, having pigtail macaques in Malaysia's oil palm plantations could reduce crop damage from 10% from rats to less than 3%, corresponding to a yield equal to crops grown over about 406,000 hectares, or um, since money is really what it's all about, that's around $650,000 US that would be gained from the reduction in rat populations. So I bring this up for a couple reasons. One, we thought these monkeys ate fruit. 
Turns out they're murderous rat killers, just cracking them open. Um, so that's pretty impressive and not what was anticipated for sure. Uh, kind of an underestimated primate here. But the other thing is that um, palm oil, as I mentioned, is kind of a controversial topic in environmental concerns um, because a lot of people think you just got to cut all of the palm oil out because it's so unsustainable because they have to use pesticides because there's all this terrible stuff going on. But if there's an opportunity to use biological pesticide, in this case, just promoting the existence of these macaques, um, that could promote this native animal, help keep the ecosystem healthy they could still harvest their palm oil and reduce pest populations. It's kind of a win-win-win. So it's a good reminder, I think, that not all palm oil is bad necessarily. Uh, that's why you should look for sustainably harvested palm oil on products if you're trying to be a careful consumer, especially, this is really good timing, around Halloween. If you go to, um, I think it's the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo. Um, but if you just Google sustainable palm oil, you'll be able to find all sorts of uh, resources on what Halloween candies are from sustainable palm oil sources. And uh, if you have a favorite candy that doesn't have that, there's instructions on their website on how to put pressure on those companies to make sure that those palm oil plantations are kind of better suited to the habitat that they're in. And so this actual, this rat eating macaque could be a new solution to that problem. Which would, which would be good for the macaques. Uh, but it's the thing is anything that you make, if you make palm oil more efficient, uh, you create a surplus of it. It lowers the price of it, and it requires the competitors to tear down more forest and grow more palm oil to stain it. <clears throat> it's how this it's how this works. If palm oil is is less efficient, and and it can be made less efficient than it is now, then there will be it will, the price will be higher. It will be less in demand. And we'll use less of it. That's not how it works, unfortunately. That, that is how it um, works. If they can get paid more for it, that's actually beneficial to them. If uh, So what? how it does work is if you can keep the space sustainable, then the, pot, then the crops don't have to be rotated out because you've depleted the space. And it's actually cheaper to the producers and they'll make a better profit. So it, it, it's better um, if you can... You, if you can grow palm oil, this is one of the reasons they look at sustainable sources in a space where it's not the only thing. It's not monoculture because in the long run, it actually benefits the farmers. So there's, there's lots of layers here. And the way that supply and demand work with these sorts of things is tricky because sometimes fetching a higher price can actually be better. So there's all sorts of weird stuff there. Um, because if you're a company that depends on palm oil, you will subsidize some of your other ingredients in order to get what you need. So there's a lot of really great resources out there. I suggest people go look at it, especially around Halloween. It's perfect timing for that. But in the meantime, just think about rat eating monkeys. All right. <laughs> I'll, I'll, still, I'll still completely disagree with you on the economics of okay. the, uh, the Well, thing. we can we can we chat more about it. We can have a conversation about that later. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I just wanted to go from one creepy primate to another. Uh, this is about eye eyes. Eye eyes eye -eye. are the nocturnal lemur that uh, is considered, it used to be considered a harbinger of death. Uh, it used to be believed that if, if an eye eye pointed its long, skinny middle finger at you, then you would die. Well, these animals, we've talked about them a few times on the show because they are so bizarre. They have these long, skinny middle fingers that they use to tap on trees to locate grubs. We learned uh, in one of my very first shows, actually, I remember very specifically that there was a cool story about thermoregulation in those middle fingers and that they had their own kind of temperature different from the general mm. body temperature in their fingers. Yes. So they have that going on. They have constantly growing incisors, though they are not rodents. They have huge, large ears. They have these hands that are so ill-equipped to climb through the trees, 
even though they are tree dwelling species that uh, they have to be very specific with how they walk and very deliberate. And um, one of the lead researchers on this project from North Carolina State University said, quote, when you watch them move, it looks like a strange lemur walking on spiders, which is definitely true. <laughs> Their fingers look kind of like weirdo tarantula legs. Um, but this new study shows us that, in fact, eye eyes have six fingers. Six fingers. Yes. What? They have small pseudo thumbs complete with their very own fingerprints that they think help them grip objects and branches as they move through the trees, since all those other fingers are so ill equipped. This is the first accessory digit ever found in a primate. So they're the first primate we've ever seen with six fingers on each hand. Um, so they, the way they found this was they looked at tendons that uh, lead to the eye eyes unusual hands. They were just looking at, at the tendons, the way the hands work. And they noticed that there was one tendon that branched off towards a small structure on their wrist. They used traditional dis dissection digital imaging techniques on six eye eyes. The researchers found that the structure in question has both bone and cartilage and the musculature allows it to move in three directions, which is the way human thumbs move. So that means, quote, the pseudo thumb is definitely more than just a nub, end quote. Um, in fact, they exert an <laughs> amount of force equi equivalent to almost half of the I.I.'s body weight. So that definitely helps them grip to the trees and support their weight as they walk through the trees. They looked at I.I. specimens for both sexes. They looked at a range of ages from juvenile to adult. They found the exact same structure on both left and right hands for every single specimen. So they, their guess is that they developed this pseudo thumb to compensate for their other thumbs that are so specialized for, for grabbing grubs that they, otherwise they would have just fallen out of the trees. So when I said they're the, the only primate that they found with this six, six digit, there's extra digits. For example, we've talked about on, pa on giant pandas and red pandas. They have the kind of bamboo shucking thumb that's like down on the wrist. Um, and that also helps them to, to grip with their climbing. Um, so there's, there's also some reptiles that have extra digits, the extinct reptiles that swim that help them to have bigger hands for swimming. So they're just like giant oars. So there, there's other examples of this throughout history. It's not the first time we've seen this super weird thing, but it's the very first time we've seen something as, I guess, advanced or whatever you want to call it as a primate. Yeah. I, I'm just wondering though, why couldn't they have had two more added and then they really would be walking on spiders. I mean, time will tell. Time <laughs> maybe, will tell. Maybe they really do have eight fingers that are little spider hands. Or maybe give them a, you know, 20,000 more years. Maybe they will. I don't know. Yeah, but their yeah. math will be d different. It'll be based on the decimal system. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. So um, it, one of the one of the fractions. last quotes I just want to say from this too is, it's amazing that it's been there the whole time in the strangest of all primates, but no one has noticed it until now. And I think the key is that they are already the weirdest. <laughs> and so there's just been, it's been this cornucopia of weird adaptations for them to look right. at that they're only now just getting to the pseudo thumb. Right. They've seen all sorts of other strange things and with the eye eyes and this, yeah. I mean, when you, you just got to document them all, get through the morphology, figure it all out. It is fascinating, though. Like, it's very, it is so very specialized. And, you know, how many other animals are out there that have this kind of specialized morphology that allows for something that is very thumb-like, that is very, um, that can move around and allow a little bit more advanced manipulation of objects. Um, I yeah. I'd to know. I mean, I dactyly, mean the six-toed cats, that's, you know, that's oh, an yeah. oddity. It's and it's not necessarily helpful, right? Extra yeah. digits happen, but so another another important thing to remember with the IIs too is that they're from Madagascar. So they're mm -hmm. the the whole island biogeography comes into play. So they have not had big predators pressure on them 
for, for a very, 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 very long time since before they were eye eyes. And so there, there's not this selective pressure to escape predators, which means other weirdo things happen on Madagascar. Without those selective pressures, other selective pressures become the most influential. Um, right. But but there's also not as much competition generally for things. So they might be the only thing in their niche that eats these little grubs, which means they can really go to town specializing on this one food source. And if there had been predators, they'd be dead. Right. So there's that to think about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lack of predators gives you some pretty interesting evolutionary oddities. It does. Thanks for the animal corner, Blair. Of course. Yeah, it's time to get into some quicker stories for the end of the show. Let's round it all up with this story. Oh, my goodness. Researchers who have been uh, studying humor. They're studying humor. Uh, they have published a study. And i it's a syst systematic meta-analysis, a review of multiple studies. They've done their work to figure out, really, is there a difference between the sense of humor of men and women? And, well, based on their study, they found that men, on average, are funnier than women. That's what they found. On average. It doesn't mean that individual men are necessarily funnier than individual women who are very funny. According um, to who? Other men? <laughs> exactly. And so this is, there are many aspects of this meta review, even though they have tried to, you know, dot their I's and cross their T's and look at studies in which they, they only looked at studies in which the sex of the person making a joke, making a funny was unknown so that the person who's deciding whether or not it was funny had no idea who was funny. They they looked statistically to see whether there was an effect of the sex of the person who was judging the funniness, whether there was an effect of location of the study, like whether there's a country or a a, a social difference in some way. They they tried all sorts of things and really couldn't figure it out. But it's not as though men are, like, a lot funnier. It's, like, only a little bit funnier. <laughs> My question is, what do we have to gain by the results of this study? So this just the, sounds like somebody's like, we got to prove it because these women are edging out our, our stand-up territory. We got to prove it. Exactly. Um, and, the, of course, though, these... People doing this study are not just looking at it to find out this basis of who's funnier, men or women. Uh, what they are looking at is the evolutionary psychology of humor. And so a lot of evolutionary sociology kind of studies, then they make up explanations for why things are a particular way. And so what they have determined, based on looking at other studies as well, in which they other studies have found that not only this is, this is the crazy result I had I was I'm, I'm shocked at these kinds of things but basically that women like to date funny men funnier men and men like to date women who think they're funny I see totally the true. sexual selection totally yes. true yes. And so, uh -huh. they, so they Absolutely are true making a sexual selection hypothesis that the evolutionary reason that men on average are funnier than women on average is that men have to compete to be funnier to get women's attention because women are the choosy sex and are going to be judging them based mm -hmm. on their sense of humor. But then you would have to assume yes. that, that choice. funniness is based in genetics. No, no, not at all. Uh, what well, it's not genetics. It, what they're it, saying is it's intelligence. It's so intelligence. It's an, and it's an honest signal of intelligence. Uh, honest signal of intelligence and mm -hmm. uh, uh, really good humor is sort of socially oriented to the point where you you have you're sh you're illustrating. I understand social context of things. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Yeah. There's that as well. 
that said, I I I wonder still if there is a social bias to even the humor that is, I guess, uh, displayed in these studies by the the you know if whether it's men or women, are is there some socialization culturally that other than this evolutionary hypothesis of mate choice and selection, are there other pressures that maybe keep women from trying to be as funny or that push men to be funnier? I mean, you know, cafeteria in elementary school is a pretty harsh place. <laughs> uh, I would I would guess that uh, uh, evolutionary pressures of living with women have caused men to have to have a really good sense of humor. Yeah, I don't know. Just for uh, Lauren, survival. Lauren Gifford in our Facebook chat room says, I wonder if cavemen used humor to attract cave women. I think I think it's a compensator, right? Like that's always what I assumed is that there's other measures that are sexually selected for as well. But if you don't have one of those you could kind of compensate, right? Isn't that what they always say about funny, funny guys? <laughs> Is it, you know, it's because they're not hot or what? You know, I'm just saying that's the stereotype. I'm not saying that's actually mm -hmm. accurate. But oh, yeah. it's, no, no. it's, yeah. so, it's so an here's interesting the thing, here's thing a... that that is a stereotype and that could be a compensator for another sexual signal. Look, if you're, if you're an incredibly attractive person, I, I think you might be onto something here. You may not need as much personality. <laughs> it, there might, you, in fact, the less you say, maybe the better uh, for your odds of being selected. You could actually be very attractive and say something that turns off the opposite sex. It's Just, true. Yeah. So, so, but if you're not Absolutely. as uh, an incredibly handsome man as I, I wish I had been born, uh, you really <laughs> do need to craft other things. In order to even be in the game. Mm. Yeah. All I can about see that as being a social pressure. All mm. about knowing how to play the game. Yes. Oh, my. Oh, my. I'd love to hear what people think about this study. Uh, I will leave a link to the study. It is available online. I'll leave a link to the study for people to let me know what you think about this humorous study. And my last story for the night is organoids. We talk about organoids all the time. We've been talking about the scariness of, oh my God, brain organoids. And what if they really are like brains in addition, they become conscious and what do we do? And oh my gosh, ethics. Well, research just coming out reported at the annual Society for Neuroscience meeting this last week, actually, and some other labs doing research as well have found that these little brain organoids aren't like regular brains. The neurons and the balls of cells are really stressed out. They've got a lot of, lot of stress hormones. They're not happy, and they are not developing the same as uh, normal, brains, normal brains. Brain organoids are not yet to be considered an issue, I think. Yeah. Justin, what you got? Uh, okay, so uh, four-legged robots. We've seen them running, doing backflips, getting knocked down and getting up again. Getting bullied in the office. Uh, but as cool and creepy as it all is, it's not what we really want to see. What we really want to see is two-legged hominoid robots. And not the not the CP three O old man shuffling around bipedalism. What we want is the capability to rebuild a man better, stronger, faster. We want mm. humanoid androids. That's what you want, maybe. Is what I want. <laughs> maybe it's not what Blake. Wants. <laughs> But it's what the rest of robot humanity want. This is, I mean, this is kind of the goal to make something that seems human y, uh, to replace us, to have a technological offspring. Because if you can't, <laughs> it's a compensation thing. If it's very unlikely that you've been selected, you want to at least build an offspring. 
the the drive is still there. Okay. So engineers at MIT and University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign uh, have this in mind. Well, not the compensating for offspring thing. I don't know if that was their motivation. But they had the idea of coming up with a two-legged robot. Uh, and we're working on methods to control balance in, in a two-legged robot, and and uh, which is sort of the essential step in being able to have uh, these humanoid robots carry out high-impact tasks in more challenging environments than they encounter in the lab, such as crime fighting or maybe even child rearing. <laughs> the, the team's robot was basically the lower part. It was like a torso and legs. Uh, and it's not an, uh, autonomous. It's controlled by a human operator who is wearing a vest and running, uh, I think, on a treadmill of some sort. And is and the, the robot is sort of following along. So this isn't so much completely robot running around. This is more like uh, almost like an avatar robot. Mm -hmm. So it's responding to the motions and the movements of the human. And they developed a vest for the human to wear that would signal the human when the robot was becoming off balance so that the human could feel that the robot was leaning too much to this side or the other because it would, it, it would create pressure on one side or the other of the vest. And the human could compensate its movements that then the robot would have to, to follow with. So, uh, and they got it to work, uh, which is really a, a, sort of a fascinating avatar type experience situation here. Uh, and, in, and in the way that they go on the article, this is, would allow a, a controlled ro a robot controlled by a human to go into a real world and mm -hmm. do things like throw its weight against a door if it was going through a doorway. To... Or like fight a giant scary fire. Is yeah, or to fight an alien. going on right now, uh, you know, just real world examples. Yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, robot firefighters. That's a fantastic idea. Uh, cutting the cutting the lines and and making sure that there's enough root, uh, fire break going on in really dangerous situations. Uh, but you know I, that's what the story was going to be. But uh, based on the AI story you did earlier, Kiki, I think this is the this is it. This is the learning system. This right. is strap people up in these mm -hmm. vests and and teach record it and yeah. teach the algorithm mm -hmm. of the AI to control to balance. balance in the physical world. And this bridges that gap between what I was saying, this can, uh, the AI can only function digitally. It can never take place to uh, do things in the real world, in the physical world, where there's all these other right. factors. This is where that training can take place, where you can have an AI learn to balance a, a physical robot in real space. Hmm. We're yeah. gonna train them to do everything. Yeah. So, yeah. better robots uh, on the way in the future and bipedal ones that can uh, run. I really, the thing I want is, you know, uh, like yeah. anybody wants is eventually for, they're going to outlaw football, American football. Oh, right. They, eventually it's going to happen. They're either gonna have to create rules that make it so safe that it's not interesting, or they're robots. Are, uh, yeah. run by robots. I'm just wondering why, and I'm sure there's a real answer to this. So if you have it, please let me know. Why Why would we want a bipedal ro robot besides our own hubris? Why, it seems okay. like such a, a bad method. It's, it, it's harder to balance. It's not as all-terrain. It's not as strong. It's just taller. <laughs> no, not necessarily even taller. Actually, I think this is a rather short robot. I think yeah. Why? Why bipedal? Uh, well, okay. For one, because one then you can potentially reason. use your hands to do things. If the robot has hands, I mean, but you're not just, you just on. Give and it the team did develop a robot feet previously with hands. hands. Yeah, but a robot previously have did have, have a robot with hands that could. Appendages. So, so, so yeah. one possible reason uh, is is a stopgap before robots have completely taken over where we're wanting them to operate in human environments, which we have designed largely oh, around nice. our sort of bipedalness. You know, uh, the uh, uh, ADA American with Disabilities Act uh, mm -hmm. has cr crafted a, enough space for most commercial areas for a 
a bipedal or a wheeled robot to be able to navigate. So you're right, we don't necessarily need it. Uh, but part of integrating uh, Androids uh, is, isn't is about have. I mean, sorry, part of the technology of creating robots that are like Androids that are simulated humans is that we also would uh, likely have this desire to have uh, robotics enhance humans who have maybe missing their limbs mm. and want to be integrated uh, in a way that isn't on wheels or isn't making them okay, into I'll a robot that centaur. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that one makes sense. Absolutely. Okay. No, I'm with okay. you on that one. That's a very good reason. Yeah. So, uh, as, and when your brain is in a jar far into the future, Blair, and mm -hmm. you have your, your sustainable uh, encasement that will allow you to live forever, you may be okay with being a robot centaur. You may prefer yeah. it. You are a fan of animals. I'll be a robotar. It'll be You great. might be a robot panda, for all we know. It's, it's just the irony of- a panda pillar. A, a panda, panda pillar, pillar which is like a... 10 sets of legs. <laughs> yeah, uh, you can be anything and be happy with it. Some people will still be attached to that human form in some way. So. But anyway, I, I thought it was a really creative method uh, of controlling. Uh, it put, puts the human through a lot of work uh, in this scenario. Yeah. But if, if we combine it with the AI and turn it into a, a training and a learning system, this would be a really good method for teaching balance to robots. Blair finish out the show what oh yeah have? just a couple of quick head quick headlines i saw this all over the internet over the past few days just thought it would be worth mentioning here if you haven't seen it rats were trained to drive tiny cars <laughs> what this yeah scientists uh successfully trained a group of rodents to drive tiny cars in exchange for fruit loops they um they wanted to see how well tests uh how, how well rats that were housed in more natural settings, enriched environments performed against those kept in labs and kind of stark environments. They were robot cars with clear plastic food containers on the top with the driver compartment and an aluminum plate on the bottom. Copper wire was threaded horizontally with three bars left, center, and right. When they touched any of those, the car moved. So center went forward, left went left, right went right. So it actually sounds more complicated to me than how actual cars work. Yeah. Um, and they learned it real well. They moved around this large area, uh, uh, an arena 150 centimeters by 60 centimeters, not huge, but it was big enough that they could drive these cars around. And what's really interesting is A, those kept in the stimuli rich environments did better than the lab counterparts, um, way better. So those that had just experienced more stuff were better. And then they test stress and they found that those who uh, learned how to drive had less stress. So they think it's an indication of satisfaction of gaining mastery over a new skill. But if you were a passenger in a car and the other rat was driving, your stress level <clears throat> did not decrease. No, no, <laughs> no, no. Hit the brake, Margaret. Hit the brake, Margaret. Don't you see the red light? <sighs> yes. Amazing. So rats driving cars. Very last thing I just want to tell you about. Uh, spiders, we've talked about their copulatory organs, their petty palps, that um, they're not exactly like other ones where there's a direct um, connection to the body cavity where sperm is stored. They kind of have to move it onto the copulatory organ and then... Um, so for that reason, it's actually made out of similar um, gene locuses as um, claws and things like that. So they actually think there's they for a long time, they assumed there was no nervous tissue in the pedipalp. But new studies looking at multiple types of spiders across huge swaths of different spider lineages show that it does look like, in fact, they have feeling in their pedipalps. And they were very excited in the study to talk about how um, this might help them scoop out uh, other males' sperm to kind of reduce sperm competition. This could help them with the actual mating process and the mechanics of it all. But the only thing that I could think about is the fact that male spiders rip off or have these organs ripped off yeah. by females and yeah. then eaten. So um, they can feel that. Ow. 
That's Hopefully all I can think good. about the story. But nobody Hopefully brought they're into up. it. <laughs> nobody Hopefully. brought it up. I want to get everyone on the phone. Excuse me. Hey, did you guys forget? <laughs> they ripped those off. It's kind of important to the story. <laughs> Hopefully. They didn't, they didn't ask that question. They're like, what well, just we're not gonna think about that like, one. How cool they have feeling and in... not cool. <laughs> not cool at all. Not cool. <laughs> I was really thinking like, oh, actually that's great news. There's no feeling in there. Cause yeah, that's not a, a not fun area wanted. for the yeah. oh no. <sighs> And I, but I, I, I love that you're you're worrying about this for the spiders. Thank you for feeling for the Just spiders. Really, Blair. it's adding an extra level <laughs> to the whole situation. <laughs> And not uh, even just, it was like, it was something I didn't even know I had that got taken away from me. Like, I didn't know that we didn't think they had nervous tissue in there. So I was just like, oh yeah, that's horrifying. And then, no, no, we thought they couldn't feel it, but it turns out they do. That's like saying, I bought you a cake, but I ate it all before I got here. What? Why didn't you just tell me? No, no, no. No, no, it's no, not. It's no, no, it's not it's at all. It's much worse than that. It's worse it than that. much worse than that. <laughs> You do not have the right analogy. Nope. No. Uh, it's somebody offers to shake hands with you and, and they keeps your hand. Oh, no. <laughs> they keep your hand. Yeah. Nope. That's more like it. Oh, hand of glory. That does it for this episode of This Week in Science. Thank you for listening. Blair and Justin, thank you for some great stories tonight. Oh, my goodness. Oh, oh, my goodness. I would love to shout out to people out there. Happy Twistoween! Big old shout out to Fada for helping with show notes and our chat room. Gord McLeod, thank you for helping in our twist.org slash live chat room. Thank you to identity for for recording the show so that we can have a wonderful podcast that we can release and thank you to our patreon sponsors thank you to paul disney ed dyer andrew swanson craig landon andy grow ed stupolik philip shane ken hayes harrison prather charlene henry joshua fury steve debell alex wilson tony Steele, richard porter mark Rosaros, jack matthew litwin jason roberts bill k bob calder eric knapp richard brian condren Dave Neighbor, Howard Tan, Gome K, Donald Mundus, Sarah Forfar, Dan K, Matt Bass, Darwin Hannon, Patrick Pecoraro, Ben Bignell, Jean Tellier, John Gridley, Corinne Benton, Adam LaJoy, Sarah Chavez, Rodney Lewis, Tiffany Boyd, John Bertram, Mountain Sloth, Seth O'Gradney, Stephen Alberon, John Ratnaswamy, Dave Friedel, Daryl Myshak, Paul Ronovich, Sue Doster, Dave Wilkinson, Noodles, Kevin Reardon, Christoph Zuknarek, Ashish Pants, Ulysses Adkins, Artyom, Rick Ramis, Paul, John McKee, Jason Olds, Brian Carrington, Christopher Dreyer, Lisa Suzuki, Jim Drapeau, Greg Riley, Sean Lamb, Steve Leesman, Kurt Larson, Rudy Garcia, Marjorie, Gary S., Robert, Greg Briggs, Brendan Minish, Christopher Rappin, Flying Out, Aaron Luthen, Matt Sutter, Mark Hessenflo, Kevin Barachan, Byron Lee E. O. Thank you for your support on Patreon. If you are interested in supporting us, you can find information at the Patreon link at our website or go directly to patreon.com slash this week in science. On next week's show, we will be joined by the bug chicks. Mm. That's right. The bug chicks, they're local to Portland, but they travel around the world and they are entomologists and educators. And we're going to talk with them about bugs. Once again, we will be broadcasting live online, 8 p.m. Pacific time, twist.org slash live. You can watch and join our chat room. Don't worry if you can't make it, though. You can find past episodes at our YouTube channel or twist.org. Thank you for enjoying the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science anywhere where podcasts are found. If you uh, enjoy the show, remember to tell your friends about it. If you didn't enjoy the show, you could still tell that they might still like it. Truth. For more information on anything you've heard here today, like pictures of those rats driving cars, show notes will be available on our website. That's at www.twist.org, where you can also make comments and start conversations with the hosts and other listeners. Also, while you're there, please pre-order our 2020 Twist Blair's Animal Corner calendar. 
Absolutely. You can also contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at ThisWeekInScience.com, Justin at TwistMinion at Gmail.com, or Blair at BlairBaz at Twist.org. Just be sure to put Twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in your subject line. Otherwise, what will happen to the email? Oh, spam filtered into oblivion. I oblivion. You can also hit us up on the Twitter where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember... It's all in your head. <laughs> This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Science is coming your way, so everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth, and I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, science, science. 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 This week in science, this week in science. This week in science, 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news That what I say may not represent your views But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan If you listen to the science you may just yet understand That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy, jeopardy, jeopardy. And this week in science is coming your way so everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our methods instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of Toxoplasma Gandhi Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, science, science. science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, science, science. Got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got But how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you learn anything from the words that we said then please just remember it's all in your head cause it's this week in science this week in science this week in science 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 science, science. science. this week in science this week in science this week in science 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 science, science. science. this week in science this week in science this week in science this week in science this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, this week in science. And I'm the only one here. Explain things you've heard with more than intuition. A line of reason shows the way to go. New conclusion. The methods of hypothesis and patience are the only things I need. Put 
on a pair of goggles and go looking for the things I couldn't see. The answers lie somewhere within this scatter plot top. Our first assumptions were correct, just prove the rest. It's hot. The methods of hypothesis and patience are the only things I need. Disturbing. Lovely. Very lovely. <laughs> oh my god. Hold on. Wait, wait. I can't even. <laughs> oh no, I switched it off. Uh, there we go. Oh, did you guys listen to all the white noise? Uh-uh, I didn't hear it. No. Good. Did it just go to the other song? Good. So we're in the after show? We're in the after show now. Blair, I think you're wrong about something. Oh, now we're gonna you're gonna take us back to the economics conversation? Is that what's happening? So I'm I'm in the middle of, of a of a space battle, so <laughs> you fight on. <laughs> reach out with your feelings. On my... I think you're supposed to reach out with your feelings. Or or uh, keep your right. uh, blast Neonic shield. Blair. Down, ah! Starting... Ah! Oh no, that's awesome! Wait, can Wait, you do it happening? again? It's happening. It's all happening. Can you do it again? Can you, can you hear any of it? No. You having... Can you see in there? Oh, we're starting our attack run. Yeah, oh, an attack run. Wow. Awesome. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, so basically, if I can just say what I meant in a nutshell. Yeah. Um, if I can focus while this is happening. I have to shut this <laughs> off. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, oh my God. Oh full on simulator. Shh, 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 shh. It does the whole battle. Wow. I know. So you can I don't know how long it is. I haven't tried it yet. Okay. So basically what I was trying to say was specifically with a palm oil and with stuff that um, isn't finite, the problem is that if you drive up the cost of the stuff that's made um, sustainably, people will pay for the unsustainably grown stuff. And in this case, it's not finite. So by driving up the price, you're not hurting the industry. You're only hurting the sustainably grown stuff. If you're talking about finite things, there's actually a very specific bell curve, where as things get more expensive, they actually get more valuable and valued in Western society. And eventually it hits a point where there's a drop off because people don't want to pay for it anymore. Palm oil is a weird thing because it's in almost every food we eat. And so and in other products. Right. If yeah. soap, stuff like that. It's not yeah. going away. Mm. Asking for people to not use palm oil is a yeah. dead end, which is why oh. the people who are focused on palm oil issues have completely changed the narrative in the past five years and have completely switched from talking about eliminating palm oil to identifying sustainable palm oil and they have made a lot of strides they've put pressure on certain companies and they've changed their sourcing of palm oil and yes the their candy bars might have gone up by 15 cents 
but overall there's been a positive impact there. So uh, this, this, this uh, adding macaques to mm -hmm. the palm groves or whatever they mm -hmm. are uh, can only be applied to a sustainable uh, palm oil. Uh, it, not necessarily. It can be any of them. It's just reducing yeah. the need for pesticides. Right. Right. Uh, so, uh, but, and but it's then, not so really then it adding them either. It's just not kicking them out. Okay. Yeah. They're already there. Okay, so but that's the I guess that's the point then. It also makes the unsustainable ones more efficient. True. Makes so so it's yeah. not it's not creating that dichotomy between uh an efficient and non efficient. What it, it's doing it ultimately it, it makes it better because if you have wild animals in that space then um, you probably have other things like other vegetation and other animals yeah. in that space as well. So it just kind of breeds into, into that. Okay. And one of, but, one of the issues, I mean, if it's not just, I mean, they're saying it's these macaques, but if there are other primates who are potentially doing similar things to this throughout, I mean, the palm plantations are one of the big deforestation uh, tools that, not tools, but it's big things of deforestation that are leading to primates lo losing habitat. And as primates lose habitat, they they're dying out. And like primates are, um, they're, they are you know our closest relatives on the on the planet. And so, it, if if primates are dying out, things are probably not getting great for us either. So. Yeah, um, uh, it's just yeah. It's, yeah. You're right. It, there's not there's not a distinct difference in particular with the macaques but um allowing wild animals to be in a palm field are are a good indicator of moving in the right direction yeah that's that's basically all i meant is that kind okay. of allowing wild animals into that space brings it closer to being sustainable because you're not kicking animals out you're not displacing animals which is one of the problems that palm oil has is displacement uh, so it, it's, uh, yeah, uh, it's not displacing this one animal then if they find an advantage to it. So that's, again, great for the macaques. But again, my point about making the, the resource cheaper, because it's going to, if this was implemented, if this has this, uh, 8%, 9%, uh, in, in harvest, it's going to get used. That's too big. That's the kind of increase you really dream for uh in anything to to have that much of a bump if the price is lower then it reaches more markets there are people who even at the low price of palm oil today that you say is in all of these different products if the price were a little bit lower it could be in a couple more markets and so if the price is a little bit lower and it starts to get into those markets now there's a desire to continue to be in those markets which means we need to cut down some more for forests and put in some more palm oil. So I mean, that, that's an interesting theory. I, I, I'm i not sure just because it's already pretty much the cheapest oil. Yeah. It's and already it's pretty, the one that if you're trying to cut costs, yeah. that's what you're using. It's pretty ubiquitous, like Blair was yeah. saying, throughout so many products. So, so, but the, but then it will, yeah, it, it may it may be it may be already at that threshold. The the story that comes to mind is the story of coal, when uh, coal was mostly used in the United States for train fuel. We didn't have the Egypt's uh, mummies to throw in there and, and fuel our trains. We needed we needed coal, so most of the coal went to the the railroad barons and and fueled these these steam engine trains going back and forth across the country. And a, a new generation of engines were developed to be much more efficient at using coal. So they used much, much, much less coal than ever before. And the price of coal dropped considerably. And what happened was then, hey, now it's cheap enough. I can use it to Everybody heat the home. Everybody can use it. Uh, yeah. Industry started using it uh, in their forges or their foundries or whatever, the cook, whatever they needed to, to create heat the, the energy from and and then it became so cheap that it became used more Boop. Boop. 
Whoop, up. Frozen. More and more and more. Mm -hmm. And coal became the thing that everybody used. If he comes back, I'll stop talking. But <laughs> I think I understand. I understand the connection. And I think it's yeah. an important thing to keep in mind. But I, I also think it, it, what it boils down to is assessing the real cost. What is the actual cost of a thing? And if yeah. you, you are doing monoculture and you have to rotate crops and you have to clear cut a new forest every two years, that has to be part of the cost of the thing that you're selling as well, which I think is what this get to gets to. So if you cut cost in the short term, if you're also cutting costs to consumers, that has a dangerous fallout. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it sounds like that's what you're warning about, basically. Justin. Uh, cutting costs creates more demand. So uh, one of the things that uh, there was a there's a documentary somewhere that were talking about avocados. Avocados was a California market. San Diego made avocados and they pushed mm -hmm. for it and they lobbied for it and they got avocados into more and more markets. They had some health studies that came out and it became a very it started to grow back. This is like 70s or 80s or something like this. At some point, Mexico uh, started growing avocados and they started flooding the market with it because apparently avocados grow great down there in certain regions of Mexico. And the California avocado growers were like, oh, no, there it goes a good thing. We were getting all this money from avocados. Now somebody else is going to mass produce avocados. What it did was make avocados for a while cheap enough that people around the world got a taste of avocados for the first time. And there was enough of them to go around. Now, it's like the number one digested food uh, during the Super Bowl. Right. I mean, it's uh, yeah. like they do like a, I like guess a, some insane high percentage of their business around that one day. But now it's you, you can buy avocados in, in Europe. You can buy them throughout the South of the United States, which wasn't a thing. I had met Southerners uh, a few decades ago who had never even heard of an avocado. Didn't know what I was talking about. Now everybody knows about avocados. But everybody's but eating avocados now. I would I would argue that this kind of story makes sense, except that it starts from a place where avocados are scarce. And so I think that that's kind of the difference here is that avocados, I would almost say, are to vanilla like milk is to palm oil. OK, so it, basically no. you're saying that, like, if if vanilla gets way cheaper, everyone will start using vanilla more. Sure. Because it's kind of expensive. Okay. It's like nine bucks for a bottle. But but it's still specialized. But I don't think milk consumption will increase if it drops 50 cents for a gallon. Absolutely. I think people who, Absolutely. I think people who drink milk drink milk. No, that's not true. Uh, you would see cheese prices drop. You would see yogurt prices drop. I mean, the, the downstream effects of these things are incredible. And and the the the, the resource that is getting burned uh, by avocados isn't forests, it's fresh water. Uh, there are huge communities uh, that have issue. been taken, that have had their fresh water taken away yeah. to put to avocado production. There's also been like spikes in crime that have been involved in corruption and these sorts of things. But the, the, the point of it is making it cheaper uh, making it more efficient created greater demand. And that's usually the pattern we see. It, when oil, okay, here, think of it very simple. Uh, gas prices go to $5 a gallon, uh, $6 a gallon. The, is this, for, for, and it happens just at the beginning of summer. Do people travel less for that summer vacation? Do they go less? Yes. Do, they, are, do more people think, oh, I'll take the Amtrak instead of driving my car to work? Yes. Be, be, people become uh, more frugal when prices are high. If gas prices went down to 25 cents a gallon, who do you know that wouldn't be on a road trip right now? Yeah, but, but I think the difference is that Oreos already cost $1.99. It's, they're not going down. They're not. And I think that's the difference is that even if the cost to Nabisco for palm oil drops, mm -hmm. the likelihood they'll actually drop the cost of their food. I don't know. They it's just going to increase their profit margin. 
Yeah. Right. But 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 that's the, okay. So then then the other aspect of it though is that you're Nabisco, and I I don't know. See now you're going to make me think of who does Nabisco compete with? Uh, whoever their competition is. Whatever. It's the other cracker cookie company. The other cracker cookie company <laughs> who's using the sustainable oil, who's the olive oil cracker company. Now Nabisco isn't just 50 cents a box less. They're 70 cents a box less. And you might not think that's enough to make a purchase decision, but suddenly they move a million more boxes of cracker. Okay. So, so now. Right. But at the same time, you have the ecology side, right? So people are willing to pay three times as much for laundry soap if it's from seventh generation. So this is the other side of it, right? Is in it Sh California, Cheyenne Mountain? in San yes. Francisco. Yes. Look but where, Cheyenne, go but look where seventh generation on, is sold. It's not everywhere. It's niche. The, it's the, niche. The thing that's going on with palm oil is people are putting pressure on companies to make the right decision of where they source the palm oil from. And there mm -hmm. are some very large providers that have shifted where their palm oil comes from. Maybe because of consumer demand, maybe because they've recognized that where they're sourcing palm oil from is not sustainable and they might not have palm oil in five years. So there's, there's benefits to moving to sustainability. And I think ultimately that's what this is about is that if you can identify that a natural space is advantageous, if that's by letting the local monkeys come in, if that's by reducing the amount of chemical pesticides, if that's by reducing monoculture and growing coffee in between your palm oil trees, that is all a benefit to everybody along the line. And that is the part of messaging that needs to happen because removing palm oil from the equation completely is not realistic and not going to fix all of these people who depend on palm oil to survive. I, you know, you're right. We have to get rid of the people who depend on the <laughs> inconvenient resource. No, that's, that's like, well, like the argument that we should keep the rainforest when the local farmers are like, I would actually have a better living if I could burn down another thousand hectares of it. For a little bit. That's the well, problem. Well, yes. Yes, of course it is. For only a little bit, like not even an entire generation. Mm -hmm. That that field will go barren. Yeah. And we can grow uh, corn oil. We can produce corn oil in places where nothing has been not farmed for generations. Uh, so why are we, why are we, do we really need to be burning down rainforest? Do we really need to be in uh, Corn oil Kelly doesn't do the same stuff as palm oil. It's different. Yeah, it's different. it tastes different. different. So, um, the I mean, the cool thing is that, for example, if I can give a shred of hope here, um, is that in in certain places, like in South America, um, farmers are actually banding together, forming little coalitions or groups, um, buying huge spans of land that they own together, and rotating the crops that they are responsible for through that land. And then you can reduce the amount of pesticides you have to use. You can reduce the amount of fertilizers you have to use. And um, doing all of that can have a really big impact on the, the they have benefits on their livelihood from doing that. Yes. Um, and the local space also, the, the ecological space has benefits from doing that. So there, there are opportunities for people who have done something a particular way for a very long time to um, learn how to do that more effectively. Um, the key is to do that in a way where you're not a white person walking into someone else's space and going, you're doing this wrong. Let me yeah. tell you how to do it. So it's about building proper relationships with local communities, letting them teach each other, letting them participate in research to figure out what is best for those spaces. And I think that's where these things really get interesting. So I didn't look in this particular story, but it's possible that the palm growers in that space, probable, were part of this rat eating monkey research. And then those people could see the benefit of having wild animals in that space in real time. Would it, would it disturb you if it turned out that it was white people showing up and saying, here's why you should stop killing the monkeys. And, and the other thing is, uh, hang on. And it the other part of it is, better is it's going to be in the South American example. 
it is people of the same nationality as those sustainable farmers who have jumped on like say the avocado uh mm -hmm. bandwagon or the whatever the what's the uh, ah, the tequila cactus i can't remember what it oh is. yeah um who are jumping oh, on those remember, yeah. bandwagons as large companies who are the same nationality doesn't matter uh no, who are that who are get get uh uh leveraging water rights for this large payout industry who are then taking the water from those sustainable farmers who are now living in a desert. Right. I think, I think, that ran I think you're, you're messing gone. with my words here a little bit. I am. Ultimately, because they were very articulate. All and, I'm saying and horribly uh, is misplaced. That part of part of learning sustainable practices in farming is recognizing the cultural implications of these things and working with communities instead of walking in and telling them what to do. I completely disagree. <laughs> I'm glad you're not in charge. Yikes. <laughs> well, no, I mean, look, uh, I, uh, when, when, when you say cultural decision-making, I have absolutely no idea what that means. That, that means... could be. That could mean uh, we have uh, been farming here for the last two hundred years. We have a system; it works. That could be cultural farming. The other cultural farming could be, yeah, we've been uh, we've been cutting down trees for several generations, and yeah, it is weird that they're not growing back like they used to. But we're going to keep cutting until you know we biggering and biggering and being a onceler like. I, so I didn't, I didn't say cultural farming. I said you have to hold culture into account when you are bringing in new information into these spaces. So basically, you can't just walk in out of nowhere and say, you're doing this wrong. Do this this way. You have to learn why people do it that way, what their values are, and how you can meet them halfway with the right. What do they need? They might not just need money. They might not just need education. They might need tools. They might need um, a different way of thinking about the space. A really good example of that is the snow leopard. So the snow leopard is hunted um, sometimes for fur, but the majority of the time they're hunted because they eat people's livestock. And why do they eat people's livestock? Well, people in the Himalayas use the mountain as one of their four walls in an enclosure for their yaks or their goats. Problem is, that's not a wall, that's a ramp. And so the snow leopards can go right into their space and eat all of their livestock. So on top of that, the snow leopard has a reputation for being bad luck because this happens. So if you can, instead of going in there and saying, stop killing snow leopards, you teach people what the benefits of having snow leopards in your space is, You like that they scare away other predators. You um, teach them how to build an enclosure that excludes snow leopards, and you help them build pride over the snow leopards in their community. And there are areas in the Himalayas now where snow leopards are like on their flags and on family crests and they're proud of this animal and it has completely changed their culture. And it's not because we went in there and said, stop it. We went in there and figured out why they were killing them, what they thought was happening as a result of the snow leopards and how to eliminate barriers. Yeah. But I think that's very different than uh, us consuming a resource that's half a world away. It's like saying, okay, you need to be really proud of the blood diamonds and you need to, I mean, it's part of the culture. It's part of the local culture to go uh, work for uh, horrible wages and put your life in danger and terrible working conditions uh, to get diamonds for people to wear on their wedding rings. But we want you to understand that that's really good for your health. I mean, there's like, there, there's, there's versions of this where you're saying that totally makes sense. And there's versions of it that are just uh, enabling exploitation. You don't have to take it to 11 every time. In that case, maybe their their um, ancestors and their ancestors' ancestors have been um, miners. And so that is the tool set that they have. So how can you use that tool set for a different trade? Or how can you adjust <laughs> what it is they are looking for? There's lots of different ways that you can do this without walking in and telling people that their way of life is wrong.
Well, right. I don't think you tell anybody their way of life is wrong. I don't think it has anything to do with their way of life. I think you stop buying blood diamonds. I think you just stop buying diamonds. Period. As jewelry. Well, that would that would be my approach. Well, um, good luck with that. Fake but diamonds it, are awesome. You teach people that fake diamonds are amazing. I think yeah. that that you can Cubic do zirconium. both. You don't have to pick. Oh, that's yeah, that's, Blair, uh, Kiki, yeah. that's only because you've never been in a cubic zirconium mine. You have no idea the conditions under which people are risking no, their lives. No. I mean, the ones that they're making in like you know cool science things in a laboratory where they make a cool fake diamond and nobody is harmed in the process yeah. except the carbon mm -hmm. and it's made to be more beautiful carbon. just because so, you don't respect how beautiful carbon really is it's so amazing it does so many it's, cool things it's beautiful on the inside it's so much more social <laughs> than the rest of the elements all right uh it is uh now so, seven in the morning uh, yeah, almost, so, and I have not slept. I want to read the letter. Oh, there's a letter? Did I read you the letter? I read Blair the letter. What's the letter? How appropriate. <laughs> it's time to read the letter. What's the letter? <sighs> I'm trying to, let me see if I can find it. Hold on. Blair, you've, you've heard the letter? Oh, I sure did. Oh, why are you saying it like that? I think it's a very interesting letter. Uh, where did it go? Oh, there we go. There we're coming down to it. There we go. Who's the letter this, from? Who's letter two? Why did we two, get a hold of this letter? Dear Twists. Oh. I love you guys and love the show. Uh -oh. I'm a psychologist. Uh -oh. I dig every episode. Uh-oh. Question, though. Yeah. Blair and Justin, are you siblings? <laughs> did you used to date? Or do you really just not like each other? <laughs> a big fan really i am <laughs> brooke <laughs> well brooke <laughs> i wonder how much brooke watches the after show for the extra stuff mm -hmm. yeah so <laughs> i i will i uh, blair's probably won't want to talk about this i will tell you blair and i used to be siblings yeah uh, <laughs> Uh, in a past life, in a past uh, life. We, we took <laughs> we took a genetic test that showed that we have absolutely no genes in common and which raised some questions uh but we'd already built in uh through habit and behavior a rivalry uh for for okay so, for kiki's affection is that for kiki's effect, yes. yeah. we have a rivalry for kiki's affection both feeling like oh jeez oh. oh no you froze <laughs> at least it's not me this time I'm oh, waiting for boy. mine to freeze again oh that's right what happened strength is asking what happened to Jim to oh, Jackson yeah, that was a long time ago their passes father <laughs> that was a very long time ago I didn't I didn't shut you out that was just the internet interwebs <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, it's not possible that Kiki can love us both. So <laughs> one of us, not both of us, the same I love amount. You both no, not equally. not on the same episode. Anyway, so we both have. <laughs> Everyone has a favorite. Yeah, no. I know. You have a favorite. I, yeah, you. Oh, yeah, you do. <laughs> have a favorite. Yeah, you, and I can see it. No. I can totally see it. I know. It's fine. I'm fine. <laughs> Everything's fine. Oh my God. Uh, fine, by the way, I mean, after, uh, insecure, neurotic, and evasive. But yeah, um, I'm fine. Justin, you're the number one son, so. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a favorite. I'll never son. be that. Uh, Frumpy B in YouTube says conjoined twins. It all makes sense. Oh, no. <laughs> Let the wild speculating begin. No. <laughs> Too much fun. I thought I thought that letter was very funny. Yeah. I appreciate it. And especially this. Oh, they must be a marriage counselor again. if they think uh people who date interact that way. Oh no, that's true. <laughs> no. Really? Like I feel like I would have I would have bailed out. 
a long time ago. Yeah, if that were, no if offense, that Blair, were the case. Oh, none not taken. Work out. None it's taken. Not Feelings work out. mutual. It's not going to work out. You have way too many wrong opinions. Oh, boy. <laughs> okay, I have to um, go away now. My jet lag. Oh, my gosh. I almost didn't make it to the show on the account of the jet lag. Right before the show, my body realized, Psst, you know, it's four in the morning. Like, no, no, no. It's only seven o'clock at night. And um, I got some sleep earlier, so I'm fine. No, 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 no. It's four o'clock in the morning. You have you have not slept. You're going down right now. No, no, I can't. I gotta, I gotta do a show. I'm gonna be. I have to be up for a while. No, no, no. It's time right now. Five minutes before the show, my head was on a pillow and my eyes were closed. <laughs> I'm glad that you woke up again. And that was after two cups of coffee. Whew. Now I hope you can go to sleep again. Yes, I will try. Good. It is that time. It is yes. that time. Blair. Say good night, Blair. Blair. Good night, Blair. Blair. Say good night, Justin. Good night, Justin. <laughs> good night, good night Kiki. Kiki. Good night, everyone. This is so much fun. Oh my goodness. Happy Have a wonderful week. Happy twist a ween. Enjoy Have your holidays. Holiday. I promise I won't put that mask on again. Don't eat too much candy. Eat all the candy. Be kind to your microbiome. Oh, your microbiome I, I loves candy. the candy. Microbiome wants the sugar. It doesn't want all of it. Anyway, let's science again next week. We'll be back again. Take care, everyone. Buy a calendar. Bye. Ending broadcast. <laughs>